Oh, there it is. That, that's the that you it's live. It is. It's Danny Limelight. And I need all of you it's counting to subscribe down. to According to Woods podcast on Facebook, YouTube, and all other platforms. What's good, party people? This is According to Woods, and I have the honor and privilege to welcome back to the According to Woods podcast, coming off of a fresh win at Josh Barnett's Bloodsport Blood 3, and continuing, hopefully, the winning ways at Josh Barnett's Bloodsport 4, he is the one and only Simon Grimm. Simon, what's going on? I, I'm the one and only because God knows they were smarter than to have a second one. That's... Uh, I mean, I like the Dutch. I like the Grim. I kind of uh, like to look at I look at life, and hey, it could get worse. So Grim's a good name for me. I like it. I, I it was actually I think I told you this last time that was the original pitch name. That was uh, what I had actually had sent in, and they they rejected. So. Well, I mean, you could have, theoretically speaking, you could have just been Simon. I mean, uh, that, no, no, that, that's, I would have had to have been successful for that to happen. That was, <laughs> <laughs> I it's, know. it's, I, I, it's always strange to me that they're like, what's wrong with this guy? He's got a last name. <laughs> I, I don't I, understand that logic. Which, I mean, during, during your time in the system, like, I mean, was that a thing where like, oh, we're just going to cut last names off because i mean th theoretically speaking i mean mr mcmahon right he's not even known as vince unless you're inside the circle here is what my my thought on it was now with women i think it was significantly different because they tried to get away from it due to the baggage of it sounding more like an exotic dancer than a professional wrestler even someone like Ashley Flair, you hear Charlotte. That sounds like someone who's, you know, center stage at the Spearmint Rhino. Bailey, yeah, same thing. Saying. Yeah, but then Sasha Banks is a name. That's a person with an actual name. Same thing with, uh, if you notice a lot, like, you could just call her Alexa, and you're like, Every okay, that doesn't sound quite right. Alexa Bliss, <laughs> it's a full name. Um, I, but I think that was something they were trying to get away from, because if you, if you go back to the... Uh, other than Trish Stratus, no one really had a last name. None of the women did in the yeah, Attitude Era. Jackie, Jazz, Lita. Well, Molly Holly. Molly Holly was one. Molly Holly was. Okay, there we go. We had, we had a second one. And she was the prude. She was the one who was the. Uh, yeah, right so to censor, yeah. That, all that. Uh, even I, Ivory, China, all of them. It was one name. And I think they were trying to get away from that because of that stigma. And conversely, I think with the, with the men, I don't know if this is intentional. Or if they're trying to skip a step, but it always seemed like they want people to be elevated popularity-wise to where you say the one name and you know who they're talking about. Yeah, if but you... where where it's like Matt Riddle, right? And like his he's just Riddle, and I'm like, uh, is he the Joker? Is he the Riddler? Is he a villain from old school Batman? It, it's not a great. It's not a great idea. I'm not saying it's it's going to work for everybody. I'm not saying it should. I'm saying there there is this weird mindset of the name making or breaking someone, but they don't understand that it's not as simple as lose the first name. Like there's a while they wanted Apollo Cruz to just be Apollo. <laughs> that there was a period where they and Which, it sounds like Polo though, and and I'm Fijian, and Polo is a man's nether regions. So just I don't know. I don't know. Well, well, interestingly enough, uh, in Korean, Chachi is very similar to the word penis. So when Joni Loves Chachi aired over there, there's a great deal of confusion. Little did they know, Scott Baio would turn out to be a complete dick. Ah! Ten points there. Oh, I love it. Woo, there you go. I love ah, it. I there. mean, uh, The, Kore the Koreans he, were way out of us on that one. But, I mean, that was an Eric Bischoff production. Like, hey, I used to be famous. Like, that, you know, even, even Scott Baio... Uh, Charles and Charge has a pro wrestling kind of tie-in. Oddly enough, not as big a tie-in as Learning the Ropes. Mm, this is true. Wait, <laughs> wait, which I, I think it was. Uh, so I, I, they used to actually they had a deal with the NWA, so they would have actual wrestlers. The wrestlers hated it because they got paid way less to do the show 
than to do a normal show uh, for for NWA because um, those are their, their TV taping nights. So they're actually losing money by d- making appearances on the show. So they all hated it. Which I, I, I kind of uh, jumping like 10 years from it because we saw a litany of WCW talent guest star on Baywatch. I mean, I was literally... There are many reasons why I watch Baywatch, but they were, you know, especially as a young prepubescent boy. But I mean, wrestling, you know, to see Vader, to see Sid on wrestling uh, on uh, Baywatch. But uh, it seemed like all of the boys were jumping at the chance to be uh, with uh, C.J. Parker. Wait. Well, the well, oh yeah, no, that was that was her name. Uh, that was that was Pamela Anderson's character name was C.J. Parker. Uh, but here was the deal: by the time you got to Baywatch, they were getting paid much better. Like the the guys who were doing learning the ropes were getting scale, which I think back then was like four hundred, three hundred, four hundred dollars, something like that, mm-hmm. and they could be making fifteen hundred doing uh, an NWA TV taping. So for them, it was it was a no brainer. You're making three times as much money to wrestle, or you had to go do this show that was being filmed in Canada, so you had to fly up there. I think they were missing two or three shows actually. The way the schedule worked out, it was pretty. It was I, I think uh, Jim Cornette or one of those guys had broke down the actual schedule they had to do that on. It's, it was pretty miserable because you basically missed multiple shows and multiple paydays, and they didn't re- they, the, the company didn't pay you separately for that. It was you were only getting paid by the TV company, and since you weren't a SAG actor, you were getting paid you know basically as an extra. Which I kind of I'm led to believe that Terry Funk actually kind of you know kind of uh, put through a wrench in the matrix because uh, he appeared during the 80s in a bunch of stuff. I remember watching Over the Top for the first time. I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. Like, that's the dude that that, that faced Flair, that pile driven to the table. Like, what what is going on here? Like, he, he, he did it. Oh, yeah. He was in a bunch of movies. He was in uh, Roadhouse, um, Paradise Alley, about even 10 years before that with uh, mm-hmm. Stallone. And the first time I actually met Terry Funk, uh, which was probably at this point nine or ten years ago, uh, this was when I was working for Harley. And Terry's just the nicest guy in the world. And I'm just trying to be polite, you know, like, hi, my name's, you know, nice to meet you. And oh, it's so nice to meet you. I'm Terry. Where are you from? I went, um, from uh, Northern California. Oh, I love California. I lived out in Los Angeles back in the 80s. I used to hang out with the San Francisco 49ers. I love the 49ers. I keep thinking the conversation is going to end because I'm just like, you know, going to, I'm being polite. I'm like, I got to go put this ring together. <laughs> you know, we got a show tonight. <laughs> And he's, and we start talking, and Terry Funk explained to me uh, the human concept of time. And his point was basically that as you age, your concept of time shifts because of how long you've existed. When you're five, a year seems like a very long time because it's 20% of your full existence. You've existed for five years, so at five years old, one year is 20% of your existence. But at 50 years old, it's a tenth. Or not even a tenth. It's it's a two percent of your uh, of your existence. Or no, one percent of your existence. I can't. Remember. I math is not my strong suit. Uh, that's why I get dropped on my head for a living. But point being is that it's a significantly less amount. Of, I could probably figure it out if I stopped to think about it for more than half a second. But again, if I thought about anything for more than half a second, I'd probably have a much better green screen. I, I went vertical with it. That's probably that's probably not the best idea. Someone's got I a mean, meme just the right side of my body, just the the one I, arm. <laughs> I mean, it works for the TikTokers. So I mean, you're not. I am very. Wrong. I'm. I'm anti TikTok. I'm very. I'm anti youth culture, but I have been since I was very young. I think I was born 48 years old. Were you really? Oh yeah, I I despise youth culture. I despise. Like I always have. I I get mad at it. I and it's mainly for reasons that are silly. I don't think I don't think anyone needs to be mad about TikTok. I, the only person who should be on TikTok, mind you, is a uh, is a uh, Ricky Choshu. He's the best. He's the king of TikTok. If you have ever seen his TikToks, they're amazing. Yes, uh, this is fact. fact. But I just I I don't know how to explain it other than I think I'm just I just am an old man. I've been an old man since I was a child. I I remember being furious at like eight years old when people started using the word fresh. I don't know why. I don't know that no other piece of slang bothered me. That one, I, it would drive me insane. And even now when people say something like lit, I can deal with because people don't really say it anymore. So it's not, I don't hear enough, but when something says, someone says something slaps, I just, I I get mad. I'm just like, 
I want to choke you. Yeah. I, I, you're, you're not a drag queen in 1983. That's... So much of the slang is just taken from drag queens from the eighties, and it really—I think that's what—I think that's part of it is that I always feel like by the time it gets to the, by the time I hear it, it's been appropriated like four or five times over. So at this point, we're, so no one's even sure where it came from, and I, that it doesn't feel like it's naturally being included into the vernacular. I feel like it's being forced in always by teenagers because they want to seem cool, so they're just copying people they think are cool. Oh, when you and see people that are it, it's older, a whole, use that, it's a whole other thing. Yeah. Yeah. Or when you see people that are older, kind of, uh, you know, submit to such things, it's just like, what are you even doing? You're supposed to be the elder. Like one that actually, I mean, will send me livid is a certain type of way, right? When like, da 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 da, and I feel a certain type of way. What way? Because you you need to describe what you're feeling. Are you happy? Are you sad? I guess, Are you monotone? saying something? Is say, saying a thing is a mood. Yeah, saying a thing is a mood. That always that one gets me too. Yeah. Like, it's, it's, what are it, we doing? That's not a mood. We're, we're we're proving that humans have we peaked, and we're just falling off. We're we we peaked in like 1991. That was it. <laughs> then it everything just started going downhill. And it was it wasn't that it, 1991 was that great. It was just that was as good as we were gonna do. That was that was our what uh, WrestleMania nine. It just wasn't gonna get better. We're gonna keep going. Uh, oh no, sir! My favorite WrestleMania is WrestleMania ten because it tells a concise storyline all throughout with Bret and Owen. Then you had Luger and Bret. Then you had Yoko and Bret. And then you like literally the end part is Owen coming out. Like that was a concise storyline, and I don't think they did that again until da Brian Danielson in, in you know WrestleMania thirty, literally twenty WrestleMania. WrestleMania nine has the best match in WWE history. There is no giant, oh, giant Gonzalez and Taker. The best match in WWE history is the Head Shrinkers against the Steiners. Steiners. <laughs> Where they clearly do not give even half of a fuck about each other's safety. I'm pretty sure there's one point where Fatu, like, Samoan drops Rick over the top rope to the, to the floor for no reason. They, like, press slam each other out of the ring. They, I, that was the one where they did the, uh, God, what was it? Um, one of the head shrinkers catches, I think, uh, Rick in a power slam. They go for the doomsday yes. device. He catches him a power slam off the shoulders. And it's just a violent, insane mess. It is one of those... There are so many matches that lack that just insanity where you're it's, it's it, I, I, I hear people. I'm not a big fan of tag team wrestling and I hear people be explain. Oh, it's like a car crash, it's like destruction derby. It's like, no, it's not except for that one time when it really was. And you were worried for the people involved because it looked like they were genuinely trying to kill each other. And that's, that's a level of commitment. I love to see. And I just feel like most WWE matches lack that. Yeah, but Scotty Steiner and the Frankensteiner, that dude damn near killed himself every time he tried to hit it. He landed on his neck more times than he actually hit it cleanly. That's, for a guy his size, holy shit. Holy shit. Oh, well, his the worst was the uh, the moonsault fallaway slam he used to do. Yes! Yes! Where he would he would, he DDT himself every time he hit it, it but it... And you know it must have been bad because he actually stopped doing it. Like, he kept doing the Frankensteiner. When he was in TNA and he had the drop foot so bad he could barely walk, he was still hitting the Frankensteiner. Mm -hmm. but, when it, but the fallaway moonsault he dropped in, like, 1995, 1996, and he just stopped doing it. Which, theoretically Ugh. speaking, I mean, was that the earliest incarnation of the Spanish fly? Ah, uh, that's arguable. Um, because the technically the Spanish fly is is done from a head and arm. It's not done from a uh, crossbody position. Right. right. Uh, the early I still the earliest I've known of someone doing it was the SATs. I yeah. know uh, even uh, Marafuji, uh, Nomichi Marafuji and Noah. He actually referred to it as a Spanish fly number two, because he did it by himself when he would use it. Mm -hmm. Um. Uh, then yeah, everyone after I, everyone I remember seeing it always dated back to the SATs. I don't know if anyone did it before them. It get, it can get kind of muddled. Like there are people who claim that I think Ricky Morton invented the Frankenstein,er even though you can find footage of guys from like France in the 1950s doing something that is about a half a hair away from being one, 
where mm-hmm. it's supposed to be a head scissors, but they're all but doing a Frank. They're basically going off to one side instead of going down the middle. And it's just one of those deals where I think we have a, something in wrestling where we kind of want to, we want the etymology. We want the root of everything we do. And so much was done without a camera and without record mm-hmm. being kept because they didn't think there'd be a reason for it. And people used to destroy movies. Yeah. I mean, this is, if they were just done, it's like, well, it's been, we showed it in the theaters. It's not going to make us any more money. Let's just destroy it. There's no reason to keep this TV show. I mean, there is something like, I think 300 missing, 300 plus missing episodes of Dr. Who just, yeah. they're, they're just gone. There's like nothing you can do there. They were, they, they'll randomly find one where there's like a single copy of it that was sent to Istanbul for their, for the show's run there. And it's like, oh yeah, well, we've got a original copy of this and they'll, they'll pop up every once in a while, but it's, it's insane how detail oriented we are with rec- with record keeping now. When you consider how little we kept records for the first, you know, two hundred thousand years of human existence. No, that's fact. I mean, literally the entire Memphis, like, you know, territory, it was basically you know written over every time they did a show, just so they can save on tape. Like that's that's it. I, I'm old enough to remember before. Because it was, you'll, you'll remember this, Chappelle show was the one to change this. They used to not release TV shows for home, for home ownership. Yes, absolutely. You'd ev- every once in a while, you'd see a random show like Xena that would have, that would have like the box set, but the VHS tapes were so big. Yes. And it would cost like $600 for one season. So no one bought it except for collectors. Mm-hmm. But Chappelle's show was, beyond the fact that it was the first million seller DVD, it was the first time they realized people would pay for this thing they got for free, especially if you could offer them behind the scenes footage, uh, unedited videos, whatever you wanted to sell them. And there, it was proof that you could actually, you didn't need to sell. This was where the, the change really happens, if you think about it, in television production. Because before that, you had, you know, Sopranos and Sex and the City yeah. stuff that was on HBO. And then you had the rest of TV. And you notice TV starts getting. I don't want to say dirtier as much as more realistic Thanks. after Chappelle's show when people realize if you say shit on a TV show, people aren't automatically going to turn it off and freak out. In fact, most people don't mind. And once yeah. you realize people don't mind, advertisers don't mind. And once advertisers don't mind, you can actually compete on an even playing field and put out a good show. Sunny in Philadelphia, they say some horrible things on that show, yes. but they've never yeah. had a problem. With, they don't have a problem with sponsors. It's yeah. been running for, I think, 17 years now almost. Yeah. Oh, man. Uh, I will always, I mean, when you say uh, it's always sunny in Philadelphia, I go the dumpster baby episode. Like, that was, to me, that just kind of, that set the course of where you were going to go. Uh, and it's, it's, I always bring it up. It's got the best continuity of any show on television. Yes, it does. Yes, it if, does. If, WWE, if WWE could take one thing from Always Sunny, I'd want them to take the continuity. Understand, have things have impact, have them have consequence, and have them come back later. Reward people for watching long term. Don't punish them. Don't punish me by having the ring break every time you know, Big Show does a superplex or gets superplexed. Mm-hmm. Because the first time, you're like, whoa, that was crazy. The second time, you're like, oh, okay. Third time, you're like, oh, come on, man. Or Shaq like, in like wrestling. It, it, Oh, I'm. You know what? If they don't list him as being a master of Shaq Fu at least once, if if Excalibur doesn't bring <laughs> that up on commentary, I'm gonna be mad. Especially I will reg- the video game. Yes. Oh, he, it got remade. It got remastered it, because the game is so infamously bad. They basically remade it to, as as an apology recently. I say recently. So, it's probably in the last five years. But yeah. So I mean, that's I, I guess Shaq's version of WWE 2K20. Uh, no, it's. Well, how can I put this? It's more like his version of E.T. on the Atari. Ah, yes. I no, no. never, never forget. Never there, forget. There's, there's a website dedicated to tracking down every copy of Shaq Fu and destroying it. No shit. Yeah, that they reminds, do. That reminds me of that disco guy that, you know, uh, Disco's Dead, the, the shock jockey, and I think it was like, what, Detroit or whatever? That uh, mm-hmm. took all the disco records and whatever, and and basically. Oh yeah, yeah. At the, at so the, that's what it reminds me of. Except that he, they're not doing this with anyone watching. They're just send us your copy of Shaq Fu. We'll destroy it. Wow, okay. that, that's all I mean, it is. 
I mean, if you're going to get a gimmick, you might as well. I mean, sure. it, it's no Hall & Oates emergency helpline, but it's... <gasps> oh, that is awesome. Do you not know Do about that? Pers- I know about that. I, I, and yeah, horribly, you, you... I mean, horribly, I, I learned about that the same, I mean, like, um, span of time as I did uh, meetspin.com. Which was Ooh. not good. Yeah, not good. Oh no! Not good. Well, we—I I told English about it one time. We were driving. Uh, it was late, and he did not believe me. So we had to look up the number, and we're calling it as we're driving. <laughs> and he—he he was blown away because he had no idea that they were actually going to. He was like, "Yeah, pick a song. You want? You want Man Eater? You want? You want? You know? You got four choices." That's it, it's. I mean, <laughs> uh. Which. Which compared you know, compared to road trips uh, in a a decade, let's just say decade. We're not even going into the seventies and eighties and what have you, but like just a decade earlier, what kind of debauchery would happen there? You know, versus would, calling up a well, you you it's it's shocking people for huh. as much as people lament certain aspects of professional wrestling in the modern era. It's probably nice to know that most of these guys that you're going to see on TV now, that you're going to see in any event, any independent show, aren't just going to pop up dead in mass in ten years. Th- that's got to be a little, re- a little relief, you know. You're not, you're not worried that. I, I can't remember what someone had a photo of uh, one of the video games. I can't remember which one of the WWF video games, but basically Hulk Hogan was the only guy not dead that was in the game. Ooh, damn! It was like. It was like Ultimate Warrior, Mr. Perfect, Big Boss Man, The Road Warriors. I think it may, no, sorry, it may have been Hogan and Ted DiBiase were the two. It might have been the WWE. Uh, it was, but it was just like insane how many Russell of these guys probably, were dead. Probably, yeah. Yeah, there's something like that. It was like one, it was like two or three guys may have been alive. I, yeah, because I think yeah, because uh, Akeem, um, what's his name? Uh, one Man Gang. He's still uh, alive, man, right? I thought he died. He yeah. just passed away. Yeah. He he may have just passed away, but it was one. Of, yeah, that might have been why it got brought up actually. Uh, but yeah, there was it was basically like two or three guys at most that were still alive out of twelve. Oops, that's not good that's... odds for for perspective. The show Half Ton Hospital. Uh, the the guy who uh, ran it ran the hospital. If you ever seen the show, I so I, I one of the things I'm fascinated by. I bring this up every time again, any interview I can. I'm fascinated by shows about the super morbidly obese. I, I'm fascinated by how the human body shifts at to function under such an uh, additional weight. So um, the guy gives a speech and he's talking about, I started this facility 10 years ago with five patients. He said, out of the five patients, two are still alive, which means I expect three out of five of you to be dead in five years. And he wasn't saying this to be mean. His whole thing was he wanted to put the, the severity of their situation in perspective. Mm-hmm. His whole point was, I've been doing this for 10 years. And I've seen a lot of people come through here. Anything that's going through your head right now, I have heard. Anything you want to say to me, I've been told. Any fear, any excuse, any anything. There's nothing you can say to shock me, persuade me, or uh, offend me. At, because this is the hard number I deal with every day. I know this number, and I know what I see. And it's the same thing with wrestling, where you see so many guys just die. And... I mean, it actually got brought up uh, today because that clip of uh, Mike Seidel taking the moonsault. Um, oh, in AEW? Uh, uh, in, uh, no, no, Mike Seidel got hit. This is, a, God, almost 10 years ago now. I think 2009, 2010. It was when I was in Missouri. Mike was working for shows for CCW. He was okay. in a scramble match. One of the guys, Spiral. The way uh, Mike had told the story, Spiral had asked him if he was okay taking a top rope uh, styles clash. And Mike goes, yeah, it's fine. When they get up there, now the way it normally would be done was you'd be standing, facing into the ring, and you sort of fall like a tree. Both guys land flat. It's not fun, but, you know, you'll survive. Spiral picks him up, and they're facing out of the ring. And Mike's first thought is, what are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? And he starts to, he's like, okay, maybe he's going to jump backwards and belly out like a Vader bomb, which some guys have right. done that before. It's not, it's not the, the craziest thing in the world, but I've seen it done. Spiral did a moonsault with Mike in the position for a styles clash. 
So his no. arms are pinned back. He can't protect himself. He broke his wrist on impact. He suffered a severe concussion and had a seizure in the locker room when they brought him back. Now, Mike's fine today. He was out for, I want to say it was like six to eight months. Maybe It might even have been as much as a year. Like It was bad. But here's where things get kind of weird. Spiral wound up becoming a full quadriplegic uh, by suffering a broken neck in training within a year after that incident and then died from complications of his condition. No. Now that's, yeah, no, that's, it's insane, but that's also an outlier story from almost a decade ago. The, mm -hmm. the, the, the every, I mean, even there was a bad stint where you had a couple, uh, you had uh, two or three guys who were deathmatch wrestlers who wound up committing suicide. Um, uh, what was his name? Brain damage, Marvin. Uh, yeah, he yeah, committed, yeah. yeah there, there were like two or three where, but if you notice, we're starting to get, you know, we're 10 years away from a lot of that stuff. And it is speaking to sort of an improvement in the industry overall that the drug abuse, the uh, head trauma, the self mutilation, a lot of that stuff sort of going by the wayside. And a lot of the guys are a lot healthier emotionally and physically than they have been in pretty much at any point since maybe the 1950s. And even yeah. then that's arguable because uh, one of the, one of the most horrific stories uh, Harley told us was that um, Iron Mike DiBiase, Ted's father, showed up to work uh, in Texas. Harley was, yeah. I think, had the book at the time. And Mike had driven like like 18 hours, had a big meal, showed up the building. Harley told him, you know, you've been driving all day. Just go back to the hotel, relax, you know. Mike said, Harley, I came here to wrestle. I'm going to wrestle. Mike had a heart attack in the ring that night and died. Yeah. Well, I, I thought it would be that story, but yeah. Yeah, it, it's pretty, it, but it's, all, again, stuff like that would happen, but it was still kind of unusual. But there was a big run from the uh, 70s on up into the, I mean, the 2000s, like really 2010s, where it's kind of shocking how much happened and how, in general, people still gave so little of a fuck about it. It was just a crazy part. I mean, I, it, it, we, we, we're so far removed from it, we don't think of it now. Eddie Guerrero was having heart problems for months before he actually passed away. Mm -hmm. And it shook WWE so hard to its core that they revamped their uh, wellness, wellness policy yeah. only, to, only to have to revamp it 18 months later over Benoit because mm -hmm. they actually hadn't revamped it all that much. That Which, is, is, which again, it's a lot of the, the mentality was, we'll be fine. We'll just, yes, I'll be fine. I'll go out there. I'll be fine. And thankfully, people are starting to actually pay attention to their health and well-being because this is not – this is an extremely physically demanding industry, not yes. just within the confines of the ring, but in every aspect. And all those other matters in which it's it's demanding make the, the physical aspect a lot worse. Yeah, no, 100%. 100%. Which uh, the MMA superfan over on YouTube, uh, he wants to get your opinion. Uh, what's more likely, AEW taking number one spot or getting bought out by the WWE? Your thoughts? It's highly unlikely to be bought out by the WWE because, generally speaking, in order to buy someone out, you need to have more money than them. Mm -hmm. The only thing, what would most likely happen is AEW would either. One of three things, technically. It would either stay where it's at, like, size-wise. It would usurp WWE's position. Or the third possibility is that it would become a financial burden and Shad Khan would opt to not finance it and just basically liquidate the company and sell the library to WWE. Like, he wouldn't sell the company. Yeah. It would more likely be he'd sell the copy, he'd sell the trademarks, he'd sell the... Uh, what is it? The, uh, the tape library. And then he'd sell the contracts of whoever... WWE wanted it. It's basically what they did with WCW. People like to say they bought WCW, but if you really think about it, they bought contracts, they bought trademarks, and they bought um, tape libraries. That was all they. Really, they didn't like have this TV spot still. Obviously, right. TNT isn't just going to leave the TV spot to WWE. The company what wasn't left as a singular entity. It was all absorbed by WWE. It wasn't like executives were being brought over and like, oh well, you did. You were head of programming for. Uh, for uh, TNT, and if you work for uh, WCW, okay, well, you're going to be our head of None of that happened. So I, I think we really tend to believe that there, or we, we really think of it as kind of a finite purchase when it was more like buying spare parts. Yeah, so that would be that would be the only outcome that could happen. 
Yeah, but then there was also, I mean, Johnny Ace kind of is the only like executive that can't kind of came over. He's also the only executive who wrestled for the Triple Crown, so that's yes. a little bit different. This is facts. This is facts. It, oh yeah, Bob, he, what, what he wrestled. He definitely challenged myself. Oh no, he, he challenged Masawa. He challenged uh, Tawe. Um, yeah. I don't know if he ever fought. He wrestled Kawada or uh, Kobashi for it, but he definitely. He was at one point one of their higher level gaijin. People, as much as they like to clown Johnny Ace, he was out there hanging with some of the best in history, and that's not easy to do. You could be. I mean, the worst wrestler in the All Japan locker room was still better than most guys on the planet at that point. So, yeah, because that's. I mean, that speaks to the All Japan locker room. I, I think, right. and the way that, yeah. Oh, in the night. In the 90s, it was almost untouchable. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's funny because especially with the, I guess, the resurgence. Because uh, I, I don't even want to say that it's a resurgence because here in North America, New Japan had never been big up until, you know, like, you know, the access shows of the New Japan world or what have you. It was always like, you know, a, a key thing amongst tape traders. But when you talk about Brody, when you talk about San Anson and all of these litany of gajins that would go over the funks, right? They were, go they were making the trip for Baba, not so much Enoki. Enoki's focus was significantly different. Enoki always viewed wrestling as a combat sport, and rightfully mm -hmm. so, and he treated it like that. I mean, for as much as you might say, Anoki, and even then, you had guys like Hanson and Brody, uh, and they had all done work for New Japan, but that was at the point where you could still sort of work for both. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The audio went out. Let's see. Cool. And I'm going to unmute it. This happened the last time that uh, Simon was on. It was, uh, where Let me see. There, there we go. go. It should be back. Yes, yeah. you're back. Um, but uh, because Anoki's focus was more using combat athletes, you actually got some really interesting matches. I mean, Anoki is someone who had fought. He, got, he went in there with Ali. He, yes. He straight up fucked up Muhammad Ali's legs. Like, that's mm -hmm. there's no mid-ground on it. Yeah. Um, I can't. I, God, I can't remember who was telling me the story. Somebody was wearing a Antonio Noki shirt in an airport, and a woman went, well, like stopped him and went, "Oh, I know who that is." And he's he's like, "Oh, you do?" She goes, "Yeah, he broke my father's legs." It was Lali Ali. Whoa! And yeah, she was. She like didn't know his name, but she knew that's the guy that broke my dad's legs. Whoa! Yeah. That's. I mean, uh, those, those fight shop Las Vegas shirts come in. They 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 come in handy, you know. Yeah, it's but uh, Anoki, Anoki. Yeah. Oh, no, he, but he say... brought in guys like. Oh, go ahead, go. Ahead. I was gonna say he brought in guys like Victor Zangief, you know, uh, who was beyond being one of the greatest amateur wrestlers of all time. Dude is the inspiration for Zangief in the Street Fighter games. Yes, that's where is. the name came from. It's Master nice. of the Spider Walk. He is the. The man could spider walk like you wouldn't believe. Had a beautiful bridge. Man, that the bridges. And again, I do I? I don't know. Um, I, I uh, just seeing stuff about like you know Japanese wrestling in terms of like North American style, American style pro wrestling. I mean, and schools are is the bridge really taught in and strengthening the neck? Because I don't I don't know. To me, that it's few and far between. It varies. I, I, I've said before, I, I get the, uh, what's the best thing you can, you know, what should I, what do I need to do to be a good pro wrestler? And I almost always tell people the best thing you can do is train the combat sport. Yeah. Professional wrestling at its core is a combat sport. It is mm -hmm. free form fighting. Do you know what, uh, if you, if you're familiar with any sort of mid nineties, uh, MMA, you've probably heard the term Luta Livre before about yes. certain fighters coming out of Brazil. Luta Livre is very, it translates to free fighting. It is the Portuguese term that is the equivalent for Lucha Libre, which means free fighting. Luta Livre is catch wrestling that over time developed uh, use of uh, striking techniques as well as various jiu-jitsu techniques. There is a whole fascinating story about the feud between uh, the Gracies and the Luta Livre schools in Brazil from the 1960s on up into the 1980s. Yeah. And 
a lot of it comes down to, of all things, money. As And I don't mean them trying to make money. In the same way soccer is a popular sport around the world because you don't need a whole lot of money to practice it. Right. Luta Libre was, was considered like the, the common man's martial art because you didn't need anything to practice it. To, to practice jiu-jitsu with the Gracies, you needed a gi, which in Brazil was extremely expensive. Mm-hmm. So if you were poor, you couldn't train in jiu-jitsu. If you were poor, you had to train in Luta Libre. Mm-hmm. So the whole idea that this war actually occurred, this like turf war, it, it, it's a real, it's a real interesting story. I'm surprised it hasn't been made into a movie yet. Uh, but again, <laughs> combat sports on the, on the whole be, help make you a better pro wrestler because pro wrestling at its core is a combat sport. No matter how you want to dress it up, no matter how you want to portray it, when you see something like Ketsuyori Shibata and John Akiyama yes. just brutalizing each other, when you see Vader and uh, Takata uh, in UWFI, when you see someone like Norman Smiley that a lot of people in North America associate with comedy wrestling in WCW, you see him hanging with guys like uh, Minoru Suzuki when he was 23, 24 and just yeah. untouchable. You realize that there's so much more to this than a lot of what guys get taught in the U.S. There is uh, trying to explain to someone on a German suplex the importance of throwing the body high and arching versus trying to throw them backwards over the top. Yeah. And how many people throw the like, – they'll throw the, uh, the sloppy German because they're trying to protect their neck, um, and they don't understand that what protects your neck is getting the – if you get their hips up past your head, mm-hmm. you can arch – and take them down, and I mean, well, obviously you're not going to get the five points because we don't do a point system in, in, for wrestling, but the idea of, you know, over the top, feet overhead, you get the full five. It's it's sad that so many guys get in and just want to, they want to recreate something they've seen on TV. They don't want to commit to the art form. You know, they don't want to commit to the combat sport of pro wrestling. Yes. And uh, well, when you were talking about making a movie out of it, I mean, we got last year or probably the year before last. The last year was a small, but we had a jujitsu movie that basically was like a high level B movie with Nicholas Cage and employing absolutely no jujitsu. It's like for everybody that has ever trained jujitsu and won a gi, and they're like, and you know, people around them are like, oh, you're going to do that jiu-jitsu and start karate chopping you. And like, no, that's not, that's not it. No, but again, it's, it, Nicholas Cage says yes to everything, which is why he's great. <laughs> I'm, I'm excited. We are a couple of days away from the release of, uh, of, uh, Willie's Wonderland. I'm, I'm all in on that one. Have you seen the trailer for this? No. What is Willie's Wonderland? Wait, do I want to know what Willie's Wonderland is? So, so, Nicolas Cage, near as I can tell, he has no dialogue in the film. He plays a man who, driving through the middle of nowhere, his tires blow out on his car. And the mayor of the town tells him, because he owns the tire shop, I'll fix your tires if you do me a favor. Which is, you got to go to my my, uh, my place, my, it's a pizza place, like uh, Chuck E. Cheese, called Willie's Wonderland. And you got to clean it overnight. And I'll consider the bill paid. Problem is, the, this, uh, this Willy's Wonderland is haunted by evil robot uh, creatures. And so, so Nicolas Cage is being sent in there to be killed. Sacrificed, if you will. Now, what you get from this point on is a, a nice hybrid of Nicolas Cage in Con Air and Nicolas Cage in Mandy, because he proceeds to murder fuck these robots. Wow. So it's wow. almost like a reverse slasher film where the monsters are the ones in danger from the normal guy. Well, Some I Am just, Legend stuff. Oh, yeah, no. They, that, they just did that whole, like, uh, I, what was it, like the H.R. Puffin stuff or uh, whatever, but they made it into, like, the sci-fi version where the, all of the animatronics are fucking evil? Like, we just got out of that. Like, this is yeah. what sounds like that, but different. Yes, but they didn't have Nicolas Cage. Didn't have Nicolas Cage. Facts. You don't have Nicolas Cage, it doesn't count. Shout out the to the man stole the Declaration of Independence 
thrice, three times. Three times. Three On times. three occasions, he had the steel. They could not come with something new for him to do. The man who will do anything. Pete, Pete, Pete you, Nick, Nicholas Cage for me is gone in 60 seconds. And him, you know, that the scene where they're all trying to figure out what the fuck to do. And they've got that, you know. All I could remember is, like, they're hatching out the plan, all the characters are there, right before they do the awesome fucking stunt shit and whatever, but they're in that layer, and there's, a like, a green board, not a blackboard, but a green board, you know, behind them, and he, they're just kind of moving or whatever the fuck and whatever, and then all of a sudden, Nicholas Cage just goes, and they fucking all scatter. And that's, anytime somebody says Nicholas Cage, that's just automatically where I go through. I, I like to go to, uh, I think it's the, uh, what is it? It's, it's either the Family Man or the uh, the Weatherman. I can't remember. It's one of those where the guy tries to, it might not even be one of those actually, where the he guy tries to interrupt. Both of those, I think. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I know. But that's the problem is that he's done so many movies, it's hard to remember sometimes. <laughs> I just remember it's one of my favorite threats in film history is when he tells the guy, have you ever been dragged down the street and beaten until you piss blood? Now, he doesn't just say piss blood. He's like, have you ever been dragged down the street and beaten until you pissed blood like he has to take the time to scream those th those two words everything what? else and you were worried we were going to make an hour we are at 42 minutes and we have talked about nothing no, we have talked about no. nothing of value i never worry with you i never worry with you i'm always uh, like hey we'll go as long as you're one All i right? brought water this time okay i've got literally like three so uh, let's look and let's look and go right. you know which all right which Alex Ramirez says, Hey, Simon, how do I get jacked like Brian Cage? What's the secret to them gains? And what should I take? I don't think I can legally answer that question without getting in trouble. <laughs> um, I, would, I would say check out primeathletics.com. Uh, they're a sponsor of According to Woods. And it's a yes. fine... I don't know what they do. I, I'm just assuming they do great stuff. Uh, they do because good. I don't think you take on a sponsor who doesn't do good stuff. This is true. So go ahead and check out PrimeAthletics.com. Uh, and you got a plug for from former NXT Tag Team Champion. So go ahead and check out the website and get some cool shit. So I, there you go. I, I genuinely, I, I, the thing with I, I've heard about Cage, who uh, from uh, Alex Hammerstone has trained, because I'm, I'm buddies with him, and he told me that he's worked out with Cage. And he says the issue with Brian Cage, it's not so much what he does, it's the volume. Like when you do when you do chest with Brian Cage, you're not doing you know four sets of uh, you know you're gonna do 12, 10, 12, 8, uh, four and four, and then just increase the weight each time. Brian Cage are doing like thirty sets. Mm -hmm. The guy is just insane in the gym. He just he's gonna push until he is going to vomit. And I I actually knew Brian went before he got big. Like I, I don't mean that metaphorically. I mean physically. I, I knew Brian back in. 2003, 2004, when he was 180 pounds, uh, just a young, good-looking baby face, you know. Um, and he actually he got had, his job with. He still had the last oh, Larus, though. Oh yeah, he still had the he still had the the mutton chops. But I remember yeah. him. Uh, the story was he got his job actually with NXT the time he was there because he was the only guy in shape at a, a TV taping. And like Johnny Ace basically told everyone, "Take off your shirts right now." And he pointed at Cage. You, you got a job. Also, that's where uh, it was in NXT was or in FCW was where he got the uh, G, uh, GMSI because it was a oh. running gag. People would like, oh, Brian got to get his shit in, Mister Get My Shit In. So he's like, yeah, I am Mister Get My Shit In. What of it? Oh, I thought that was a supplement company that he was trying to rep. Like, no, it, it's literally mis uh, It started out as. Uh, there was his uh, Norman Smiley was telling us about it. So they'd always joke and say, hey, "Jokes on us, man! Turn it around." He <laughs> started calling us on Mister Shit. In. Yeah, <laughs> made it work. <laughs> That's fucking great. I, I I literally thought that was like his training. Like uh, you're talking to a guy that when I hadn't seen um, Mark Munoz, but I re re hear re people refer to the Fili Filipino fighting machine. And I thought that was like a, like a DDP yoga that you could fucking get online for three easy payments of thirty nine ninety nine ninety nine. You can get a Filipino fighting machine. Like that's, I don't know. Like, <laughs> I don't know. It's, it's a nickname. It, 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 it's, it's also weird when you find out it, it actually stands for something and it's not, you know, 
Uh, I, I used to, I used to try and get Miro uh, to uh, start a company. I wanted him to call it Bulgarian Mus- Muscular Development. <laughs> be, be, because uh, he, as a joke, sometimes you would wind up with a naked Miro behind you, and he'd just be going BigManDick.com. He'd just be saying that, <laughs> just naked Miro, and he just. Like he'd be like, "Hey man, what is that over there?" You turn around, naked mirror, and you hear BigManDick.com. Just because it made him laugh. So I was trying to get him to get uh, BulgarianMusculoDevelopment.com, so it'd be BMD.com. Because I'll, I'll I'll take a joke way too far. That's my whole goal. If you've got a, if you've got a joke, we're taking it too far. We're taking it to the point where everyone's gonna hear it and no one's gonna know it. Oh fuck! That's I. I mean, fuck, that's tremendous. That's tremendous. And Jillian Alexiel over on Twitch, shout out to Jillian, said this is a beautiful episode. I couldn't agree more. But it's because I mean, of the green screen. Everyone loves it. It's Everybody loves the green screen, which, I mean, was, I mean, would Miro doing that be better than the glorious bomb that Gargano and Ciampa were doing with Rude, theoretically speaking? Well, I here's the, here's the deal. Um... I'm the wrong guy to ask about stuff like that because I, I, I legitimately only tr- watch professional wrestling. I want to see now. I don't mm-hmm. really watch anything to stay up on it uh, as far as what's going on in any individual company. So whenever something gets brought up, they're like, Oh, did you see this? And I'm like, no, was it in Botchamania? Cause I, I watch that. Uh, it's like, if it was, Oh, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing the, the remixes of my butt, my hole. That's going to be, Oh yeah. Those are coming. I, I actually got featured. I, I actually, I made an edit that actually made it to uh, Botchamania a while back, so what, I was very what proud was of that. What was the edit? And what episode? I, I don't remember the number, but I'm the one that put the footage of uh, Drew Gulak and Brian Danielson doing the uh, pummeling. Yes. I was the one that put it to uh, Homies Over Hose from uh, Boondocks. <laughs> yes! Because the, the chorus is you bump it to the left, you bump it to the right. When you when you do the homie, you got to do it right. So it's so it's the footage them bumping their chest to the left and the right. I went, okay, that's it's too perfect. <laughs> Which that that in itself is glorious because I mean most people would boast on you know having the championships and what have you or merch they sell or whatever. No, making an edit for for Matthew that that's, oh, no, that that's hey it. that I that and the time I killed part of Corey Graves' soul, which I told I think I told you about last time. The uh, well for, the... for those. Indulge us, indulge us for those that, that didn't catch the first time. Which you you want to check out the for archives. The, for... So anyone who didn't hear the story last time or haven't heard me tell it on another, it's my, this might be my, my best story. I don't have a better one than this, I, I think. It, it always starts bad because when I have to start the interview with, so we're at Dusty's funeral. <laughs> so <laughs> whenever you have to start a story with that, it always, you get the looks. Um, but because of obviously Dusty's influence and history in the industry, a lot of people came out to his funeral. And a lot of people were present at the uh, the reception afterwards. So I'm sitting at a table with Corey Graves. And I look to my, my left, just sort of over Corey's shoulder. And I the joke forms in my head. Where I'm like, I, I have to be calm because if I start laughing, he's going to get suspicious. So I just go, hey, uh, hey, Corey, that, uh, that glacier over there? And he, you know, he looks over. He goes, yeah, yeah, I think it is. Oh, I let it sit because I don't want to rush it. You know, he, uh, he looked a little smaller than, than when he was on TV. Again, it seems like a normal question you might, a wrestler might ask. And he looks back again. He's like, yeah, I guess so. Yeah. Goes back to whatever he's doing. And just go, yeah, it must be global warming. Oh, and there was, it felt like a three, it felt like the longest three seconds in human history because I just see Corey's eyes start to widen as it washes over him that I just hit him with a dad joke about global warming. And then the sound that came out of him was as though he had smelled the most rancid fart in human history. He just went, And I think it was Connor, uh, the Ascension, somebody like that goes, what happened? He goes, God's just killed part of my soul. <laughs> well, I mean, rather the soul than the earth, because I'm, oh, hey, the, I'm just saying. 
Hey, you know, the polar bears are getting skinny, and nothing's sadder than a skinny polar bear. Speaking but nothing's bear, funnier than a, than a chubby dog. The it, Filipino wrecking machine. Thank you, yes, Clayton. Thank yes. you, Clayton. Shout out to Cal Jack, who will also be completing at Bloodsport 4 this Saturday, and I can't wait. And uh, yeah, we're, I mean, You know, he, has, he was born with a club foot. I wanted to ask him, but I didn't. That's oh, I'll, I'll, again. I I probably there's probably I probably diagnosable with some sort of a disorder because I just I I have no concept of social mores, but uh no uh, no Clayton had told me he was uh he was born with a club foot and the doctors told his dad Dave Jack who is a beast Dave Jack who holds mm-hmm. victories in amateur wrestling over Doctor Death Steve Williams yes. and Dan Severn Facts. Dave Jack is a monster. Um. He basically he got told your son, you know your son will never be able to take part in any sort of sports obviously and Dave was like ah really we'll see and Cal was a monster up at uh, up in Oregon he was mm-hmm. a machine he I've been thrown by him and it is it is a it's a religious experience because you don't know if you're going to survive it so you you I believe it was uh, Kurt Vonnegut who said they say there are no uh, atheists in foxholes and they think that's a good argument for God but I think it's a better argument against foxholes. <laughs> Again, facts. So, there, there, there are no, there are no, there are no atheists getting suplexed by Cal Jack. But I think that's more of a, an argument to not to fight as hard as you can to not let him suplex you because he will throw you. Now, is I mean, do you know if it's still that way or? Well, if, if you got to see uh, Bloodsport three, um, yes. this well, technically it's Josh Barnett's Bloodsport three. Um, yes. We we have the uh, on a, we have the uh, Bloodsport Zero technically as well as a thing, but uh, right. Cal wrestled uh, Eric Hammer, yes, and Eric is not a small man. Eric is a huge man. Eric trained uh, with the uh, Anoki and New Japan stuff, so mm-hmm. he's he is not a unskilled fighter. On top of that, mm-hmm. and Cal got to he was gut wrenching him like mad, mm-hmm. and it's one of those matches you it's. As big as Eric is, Cal was, Cal was still able to lift him. It was, I mean, I, I'm not big on watching from the curtain just because I'm generally more focused on my match and what I'm yeah. doing that night, uh, and prepping for that. But that was the one I was, I was, I wanted to see because I was like, Cal is a monster, and I want, and I, as well as I know him, was like, I want to see him fight another monster. I want to see King Kong versus Godzilla. You know, I don't, that's, I don't. That's it. Yeah. That's literally what it was. And, and you didn't see you didn't see Kerry Von Erich when he had the foot deal, gut wrenching oh, anyone. Uh, what was <laughs> I was told a story about him that I asked Harley about, and Har- uh, the story the short version of it was that he got ribbed one time by Baron Von Raschke by trying to pull off his sh- his boot during a match. And I, I I mentioned it to Harley, and Harley's response was, uh, "Bob was such a nice guy. I can't imagine he would have tried to do that to anyone." And it was weird to think of anyone calling Baron Von Raschke Bob. Bob Von Ra- Robert Von Raschke, or Robert Raschke was his name. Uh, he calling him just Bob. That's just a weird... It's like, it's like someone calling the Undertaker Mark. like Or Marcus, even. Like, Marcus, where are you? Marcus Cal- uh, Calloway? Where, where is he? Is he here? Marcus Calloway. Please stand up. Please take off the hat, sir. The hat... The- and the duster. I know it's longer and more badass than a jacket, but you still have to take off the dust. Sir, please take it off in a timely manner. This is we do not have which again, I keep I keep having all these asides because of these ridiculous stories. Um Terry Taylor telling us that Undertaker, they were in like Saudi Arabia or something. They tell Taker, we need twenty minutes from you. And he said, I got ten in me. And they said, We need twenty, and he said, I'll walk slower. <laughs> He did a ten minute entrance, so they could, so he didn't have to add anything to the match. That's when you know you're over. That's when you know you're a fucking top guy. Oh, well, when you're when you have that emotional investment, there is a point where people. I mean, no one's paying three hundred and fifty dollars for nosebleeds to see the Rolling Stones because they think it's going to be a great show. They're doing it to see the Rolling Stones. Mm-hmm. That's that's what the emotional investment buys you is that it's the freedom to be able to do that, and no one's going to question it. It's, or the five hundred dollar cameos to to get uh, the AEW Scooby Doo whatever the fuck did you have you seen that clip? I ha- the only one I, the only cameo I've seen and I, I absolutely adored it was uh, 
was DDP's because I liked that he was able to fit in a commercial for DDP Yoga in the cameo. So you basically paid him to do a personalized commercial for DDP Yoga. And th- if that isn't just milking it for every nickel you can get, I, I don't know what is. And I am, I am in awe of it. Yeah, DDP is that a uh, funny story about DDP. The first time that I met him, I, it was when he was still out here in California and I was working at a FedEx office in Marina del Rey. So it was weird because like, uh, Austin, Austin, DDP, and I can't remember the third, but they all lived within like five minutes of where I work and they would come in often. Oh, the guy, the, 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 the guy with the stigmatism in Bloodsport, the buddy that got wrecked in Bloodsport. The, uh, not the, the movie Bloodsport, not the, oh, um, uh, oh, uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, no, no. I could have told you this man's name because my first thought was to be uh, Randall Tex Cobb, but it's not Randall Cobb. It's, um, no, no, no. it's the, the guy who played Ogre. Yes. Yeah, the guy who played Ogre. Yes. Uh, uh, oh, Donald Gibb. Donald Gibb. That is his name. Yes. He yes. was also on Homeboys in Outer Space. He was. <laughs> he, he was, was a biker. Homeboys. <laughs> oh, uh, you don't want to. You don't want to throw down on bad TV and bad movies. I was born and raised by USA Up All Night. Oh, Rhonda Shear, USA. Oh, Rhonda Shear and oh, Gilbert Godfrey. Yes. Oh, I, I, mm-hmm. I, I remember. I remember dude, that uh, Joe Bob Briggs dinner in a movie on on TNT and uh, or on or on a TBS. I actually am old enough to remember when Monday WCW Monday Night Nitro was actually TNT's Friday Night Nitro, yes. and it was a block of four four action movies that they'd air at like 10 p.m. Or like from like 8 p.m. to I think midnight, and it would be stuff like American Kickboxer Part One and Two, um, Danger Beach, like basically any movie you would have found in the action section of your video store that you'd never heard of, it was on there. Yes, and which that's that's what I love. That's that's the stuff I'll I'm all in for every day. So my wife's ex husband, her first husband, was the buddy in American Kickboxer Four. Nice. Yeah. That's a solid one. I a- my, my 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 most impressive one, um, there's a young woman, uh she's actually uh what is his name? Uh I can't remember, uh Kona Reeves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. His his cousin, uh she I, I met her, she trained at Jiu Jitsu at the same gym I did, and we were talking one time and I made a joke about uh what was it? Um uh what is it? Uh, Miami? Oh, it's Miami something. Miami Connection. Miami Connection, which is this famous B action movie from the eighties, uh, made by uh, I think his name is YK Kim, who's like a, a he's a big self help guru now. Really? But he'd helped he'd help yeah he'd helped to finance this movie and he starred in it. But I was talking to her about it. and They shot a lot of the film around Miami and or around uh, Orlando. And she goes, "Oh, my dad was in that." Her dad was what was a was a stuntman who was one of the bikers, one of the evil drug dealing ninjas in uh, Miami Connection, and I was I was like blown away, and because like again, I'm one of my prized possessions. I have it somewhere at my mom's house. Is a uh, it's a photo of me and uh, Al Leong, who you might know as the Asian guy with the Fu Manchu mustache from every '80s action movie ever. Mm-hmm. He was in Die Hard. He was in Big Trouble in Little China. I mean. And if he if there was a movie made in the eighties where you needed to kill a guy, he was getting killed. He, he's Mr. He's Mr. Endo from uh, Lethal Weapon. Yes, he is. He's been he's been killed by more celebrities than most of us will ever meet. Yeah, Ugh. I mean he he puts in more male celebrities than John Mayer does Hollywood starlets. I I'm I'm more of a uh, I'm more of a Josh Groban guy personally. Really? Hey, he he likes his ladies to pop, you know. I I mean get. I mean, this see, is a, this is another reference to Always Sunny. They they yes. made a joke about D trying to go to a Josh Groban concert, and they brought it back like four years later, where they actually had Josh Groban on the show in a dream sequence where D was dating him. See uh, continuity again. Always Sunny has more continuity than Monday Night Raw or SmackDown. This is this is facts, right? What are but, you? Uh, <laughs> but Don McGuire wants to know what are your uh... thoughts on old school wrestling like Pepe Gomez, Pat Patterson, and the aforementioned. Baron Von Raschke. I think I've actually met everyone in there except for Von Raschke. I don't think I've ever met him, but I met Pepper Gomez before. 
Whoa! Okay. Uh, back when I first back when I first started out, uh, him, Red Bastine. Oh, or did I meet Pepper actually? Okay, so here's the, here's why I'm unsure of this. Um, Roland Alexander, when I first started out wrestling, he would bring in a lot of the uh, Cauliflower Alley Club guys for mm-hmm. uh, things like uh, King of Indies. So I think Pepper was there because he, but he would. I also am unsure of this because I know he would always list Pepper Gomez as one of his favorite wrestlers when he was growing up. Uh, but Red Bastine was the one I remember getting a direct story from, where he talked about wrestling. Uh, God, Ray Stevens. They were in San Jose. He said it was an outdoor show. It had been raining all day, so everyone was going out, and it was so cold outside because it was in like December. There was ice on the mat, like there were sort of patches of ice forming. And he said, I looked at Red, and he looked. I looked at Ray, and he looked at me. We didn't even talk. We went out there. We wrestled a damn hour. Which may or may not have been true. I don't know. But I every story about every, every you always get from a lot of the guys from that era is they wrestled an hour. Um, That's which I they may they may have they may not have I never know. But um, the the best thing you see from a lot of those guys is that a lot of them did come from wrestling backgrounds. They came from mm-hmm. proper uh, amateur catch backgrounds, um, and they definitely had a better understanding than a lot of young wrestlers have today of how to apply these techniques and how to actually make them how to really get something out of them. I mean, uh, I, I sometimes laugh at people when they, they'll talk about things that, you know, oh, they're too, I, I've seen too many super kicks. I've seen too many of this. And I'm like, I can break your neck with a chin lock. Mm-hmm. I can, a, chin, a, a simple cross face chin lock, you can snap someone's neck with. I've had a, I actually got, we were in a bar one night and Barnett put me in it. And I was like, I'm it's like, dude, I'm well aware. You're, you're, <laughs> you don't gotta, you don't gotta try to convince me this all works. But, uh, it's the sort of thing where I think a lot of people really don't understand that execution is where the, the key is. And I think the one, the one thing that a lot of the older wrestlers had was they, because their background, they had execution. They understood how to actually use this. And it wasn't so much, I'm just trying to get a hold of you and control you until I can go to something else. It was, a, they were trying to kill you with each one of these. If they got you in a chin lock, they were trying to break your neck. If they got you in an arm bar, they were trying to snap that arm. They weren't just trying to control you until they could come up with something better to do. And yeah. I've I've definitely been in that position before. I think sooner if you grapple for long enough, you're going to wind up not knowing what you're doing. And just be like, I'm just trying to hang on for dear life because I'm in a position I don't know how to get out of. And I've, I've for a while, my go-to thing was actually I'd bait guys. I'd uh, if I knew I could, if they got me in a position I couldn't get out of, I'd basically feed my arm, knowing they'd go for an arm bar because like I know I can, I know I can break that arm bar. I know I can escape from there, but I also know if I stay in this position right now, they're going to get me. So I'm better off basically going like, oh, no, my arm is fully extended in your face. I hope you don't arm bar me and just fight it from there. Because, nice. yeah, it's, it's uh, if you don't have technique, at least have strategy. That's always the goal. That's, I mean, one or the other. I'm just I mean, one or the other, you know, and uh, Donald Gar was saying uh, he would he would his gimmick was driving a, a VW bug over his stomach. Oh, that's again one of the, a lot of the guys came out of the, the the carnival as well. So you had to have another you had to have another hustle. I had to have another side gig. Which I I, I want to ask about. Uh, uh, okay, so when you met Red Red Bastine, had you seen the clip of him as a ref and taking the bump? Do you know the bump that I'm talking about? I have no idea what you're talking about. I'm, so here's the thing: you have to. This is hard for people to wrap their head around. I've been wrestling for 20 years. I started wrestling in 2001. For perspective, 9-11 hadn't happened yet. Mm-hmm. There, there was no YouTube. There was no none of this. It was there. If you wanted to see a tape of a match, you had to physically get a tape. We didn't even have DVDs. weren't even regular at that point. Right. Yeah. So, so for a lot of the footage, you I, there's stuff I've seen that I don't remember. There's stuff that I haven't seen that I've never seen because at the time it just wasn't common. I didn't. I think the first time I saw Johnny Saint was maybe two thousand four. Wow. So, yeah, so be, was... because, yeah, but again, a lot of as common as it is to see him now, you have to understand in two thousand four, you need to. And it was a buddy of mine was like, "Dude, you got to take a look at this guy." I'd never seen British wrestling before at that point. I'd heard about it. I'd heard people mention it. I'd heard the name, but I'd never seen it. But that was also back when you know you had to drop whatever two hundred dollars on. Uh, 
25 VHS tapes from high spots or somebody like that off yeah. the top rope.com selling bootlegs or mm-hmm. uh, you had to tape trade to, to get anything. Having yeah, a fourth no. generation dub of, uh, you know, Norman Smiley match from Mexico, things like that. Like it was, it, it was the wild West days of getting footage. So yeah, I yeah. honestly, I've probably never seen it. So, I may yeah. have, but again, so, it would have been a long time ago. So the, the clip that I'm referencing that I, and I, I don't even know if it was like a major town or a major show, but, um, and I can't even remember who was wrestling, right? But Red Racine was the ref, right? And it's been shared uh, like uh, at nauseum on like social media and what have you. But there's a point where he takes a ref bump, but <clears throat> rather than just, you know, looking like he got killed, he kind of goes like this and bounces off the top rope, bottom rope, third rope flat back bump and it was just it, like it was a i want to say it was like a pull apart i can't remember the sequence but it's just so enigmatic about red bastine and what he does i think that clip especially with current day pro wrestling fans might actually overshadow his actual wrestling career which is unfortunate but it, it's the there are, there's a generation of kids that know orson wells is the fat guy at the end of the muppet movie yeah, mm. they they know nothing about his filmmaking history. That was what they knew him as. It, it's what? it's an unfortunate reality that our memory of people is usually the last thing we see him do. It doesn't necessarily mean it was their most important work or their best work. I mean, Rodney Dangerfield was hilarious, but I I highly doubt anyone is clamoring to watch My Five Wives or The Godson. No. no. So but in a lot bugs. of in a lot of cases, <laughs> Lady Bugs, Meet Wally Sparks had its moments, but again. There, there's a certain point with a lot of artists where you're you're put into a position where you have to decide if you are still able to keep up. I think there. I mean, uh, I love John Carpenter, but he'd be the first one to admit that he reached a point in film production where he did not feel like he was doing his best work anymore, and that's why he stopped. Mm-hmm. I mean, he retired. I think after Ghosts of Mars, and then I think he tried one more time with uh, a movie I'd never even heard of. I only had a, I saw a reference the other day. But he had kind of come to the conclusion. Also, I felt really robbed when I found out Ghost of Mars was originally going to be Escape from Mars. Really? Yeah, apparently because Escape from L.A. did so badly, they retooled the script and Ice Cube's character was supposed to, was originally Snake Plissken. Really? Yeah, uh, but apparently it was, they the, the studio had so little confidence in uh, the movie drawing any money because of how badly Escape from L.A. had done that they made him retool it. And so it was just kind of sad, but again, at least he was like, you know what? I can just do music and I can play video games. That's all he does now. And like, I can sell my, pro- I can have my properties get licensed out and people can make movies with them. He's not in that mode of, I mean, it's the same thing with, I don't know if you ever saw Diary of the Dead. It was uh, one of John, yeah. Romero, uh, John Romero's last films. Mm-hmm. And, or George Romero's last film. John Romero's the guy that made Doom. Uh, George Romero. Uh, George Romero's last films, and it was terrible. But it was a guy who at one point had had a lot to say with what he was doing, right. who wound up in a position of trying to use the gimmick of you know, the found footage movie to, to see if he could make something interesting. And it was just clear he it was a format he couldn't work in. And was, yeah, you're yeah. sometimes better off just, just walking away. Which, like Polly Shore, kind of an afterthought. Well, to a certain extent, Polly Shore's weirdest part was he's a he has a long history in stand up comedy outside of the the stuff people know him for, which is weird. Yes. Uh, his mom owned the uh, I think it's the Comedy, comedy Cellar in the Comedy no, Store in comedy LA. Yeah. Store, yeah, yeah, I think he owns it now, doesn't he? He's the uh, the the brother <clears> Peter. <throat> Peter owns right. it out, outright, but yeah, Polly. I, uh, there's uh, Peter, Polly, and there's a, I want to say a third brother, and they all kind of whatever. But like yeah. um, the the Peter is the one that runs the day to day of it. Polly does uh, book the okay. club, though. I mean pre pandemic. All right, but that's the whole thing. Is that it's like a lot of people. Polly Shore is one of those guys where you don't realize he actually had a real like solid piece of stand up history because of the era he was there in. Mm-hmm. But it's because he's so overshadowed by the character, which again is an unfortunate thing that happens. Like I brought up Norman Smiley earlier. Norman Smiley was tr- probably one of the last guys in the U.S. trained properly in pro wrestling. Yeah, for many years. I mean, Norman Smiley's coaches were 
Boris Malenko and Carl Gotch. Norman Smiley is one of those guys that can hurt you 800 different ways with moves you didn't think were real. Like yeah. if you, if you, I, I've, I've seen him do it. I've been, I mean, he's a machine. The guy has caused more riots in Mexico than people can count. Oh yeah. 100%. And, and he'll be the first, to, and he was going over to Fujiwara Gumi and, uh, He's going over for UWFI, and he's the guy's an amazing wrestler. And so many people only know him as Screaming Norman Smiley from WCW. Yes, and it and it's unfortunate, but uh, <laughs> the way he tells the story, uh, basically, he, they brought you know they brought me in the office one day, said Norman, we got this great idea for you. We want you to scream during your matches, and he said I don't think I can do that. And they showed him how much money they were going to pay him. And he said I can do that. Okay. Yeah, there you go. And, it was kind of that quick. It was, it was, I don't know, man. And that's like, well, you're getting paid, you know, half a million dollars. And you went, Oh, I can do that. That's, I can that's do fine. That. that That's fine. Shit. I'm fine with this. Yes. Which, uh, Joe Flynn in the rings yeah. has Norm or Smiley was awesome. And so oh, yeah. super underrated, which do you, do you have any good, I mean, he's still a coach at the performance center now, but do you have any good, uh, interactions with, uh, Norman Smiley? I, I, I love Norman. Everyone does. No one, Norman is the first guy anyone would tell you, uh, the way he described it, he's, I'm the only man in the world who's friends with Vampiro and Chris Jericho. Yes. Which if you know their history, you know that it's everyone's on one side of that war or the other. Mm-hmm. But, uh, Norman was telling us this story one time. Uh, the two people that can confirm this are Connor from the uh, the Ascension, Ascension and yeah. uh, uh, Super Panda actually was there as well. <laughs> there, there was this uh, USO tour, I want to say in like 2005 or 2006, maybe even a little earlier, maybe 2003. And they were in, I think, Korea or the Philippines, somewhere like that. So it's Norman, Connor, Super Panda... And they're all, and a bunch of other people, everyone on the tour, they're all hanging out in Vistra's room, uh, 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 Big Vis. They're in, uh, King, yeah, Mabel. Mabel. Mabel yeah. They're in, they're in, they're in his, his room on the base. And all the rooms had like a, v, uh, a VCR in them uh, with a TV. These are still tube TVs, but you know. And, and Vis had brought that Snoop Dogg porno. And it's not Snoop Dogg having sex, it's like a porno where he's rapping over sex scenes, basically. Mm-hmm. And it's just know. on the TV while everyone's hanging out in the room. <laughs> And at some point, I guess somebody is finally like, okay, let's just turn this off. And Vis is sitting on the bed, and all of a sudden, they all just hear, hey, put that Snoop back in. <laughs> it just, like, stops the whole party so we can put the tape back on. So every once in a while, Norman would just yell, put that Snoop back in. There, as, I, as, a, as a joke slash tribute to, to that moment. And Big Vis, uh, Russ and Vis. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, which... Uh, but it was, yeah. Oh, go, go ahead. You said, by the way... There, there, was also another, there was another time... Um, so Norman was always paranoid about the cameras in the PC. Because they have cameras on all the rings at all times. Right. Which they say, it's oh yeah, you know, if Triple H can pull this up in the office in Stanford at any time. And all I'm thinking is like, yeah, because Triple H really has time to pull up... I'm not saying he can't physically do it. Mm-hmm. I'm saying I don't think he's got the time. I don't think he's like... Man, I really need to know what's going on in Ring Three right now. I just gotta let me pull this up. I gotta, I gotta, I gotta watch this for a minute. I just gotta. Um, but Norman was bas- was sore after training, and he basically was having me put him in holds so we could stre- so he could stretch, and it would look like we were wrestling, and he was showing me holds, but I was actually just like stretching his, yeah, stretching his legs and his back out for him. So that what? that was a, yeah, like, yeah just make it look like just make it look like you're putting it on me. It's okay. You you were literally Black Magic's chiropractor. I, I, no, I was the go-to chiropractor guy uh, when they didn't have a chiropractor there. That that's not a joke. Um, I, I yeah, a couple people can attest, more than a few people can attest to this. I just knew how to pop back. So I I had a good technique for it. Uh, there's no joke. There's no punchline with that. I'm just really good at it. It's just something I know how to do. There you go. I mean, again, yeah. you know, a, a man of all trades. You know, which uh, and, and I make money at none of them. That's We'll we'll get you there, Simon. We'll get you there, damn it. Uh, yes. we'll, we'll get you there. Uh, and Don McGuire says, uh, if you had a Peter Griffin grind my gears moment, what would that be? The inclusion of high fashion into pro wrestling. Mm. It's it's more of a common trend. Um, I, I I don't know. I have theories on the rooting, but I think the inclusion of high fashion into pro wrestling, I don't approve of it. Because I've always found it to be a grittier, more... I. It, it's it's more 
uh, what's his, it's more John Waters than uh, Vogue, I guess is the best way to put it. Like, there, there's a griminess and a filth inherently to the violence and the and the and the camaraderie of pro wrestling that I feel like mm-hmm. high fashion doesn't have. So when I see anyone, any wrestler take like high fashion photos or that style of photo, um, I just, I, it bothers me because my first thought is nothing about this feels grimy. This is too clean. This is too pristine. This is a beautiful photo. Uh, Harry Aaron, who uh, is a friend of mine, he does photography. He posted some photos he took of uh, Maine State Posse. It's a tag team up in uh, Maine. They work for Limitless a lot. Okay. And I love those guys. I think they're very talented, and I hated these photos more than anything. Really? I, just, I hated it because all I could think was, this is pretty. Pretty people have something to lose in a fight. I want ugly people because ugly people will go ham. They've got nothing to lose. Cal Jack has a permanently broken nose. Yes. Facts. Yeah. Me, I, my head is almost a, a complete, you know, uh, rectangle. It's pretty people have something to lose. We don't. We'll go out there. We'll kill each other because we got nothing to lose. I'm never going to be like, oh, man, I'm not going to sell any more 8x10s. I'm not handsome anymore. I wasn't handsome to begin with. So I I, I can go out there and I can, you can bash my face. Actually, that's if you go back and watch, it was, it was an advantage I had with Matt Mikowski. He's cracking me in the face. And I'm like, come on, man. This is the one part of my body you can't hurt. He was... Like I can get uglier, I can keep getting uglier. I'll just make more money off being ugly. You want to get me? You go to the body. You go for a joint. You try and break my arm. I like I can't do a whole lot with one arm, but you you want to crack me in the face? I'll I'll live through that. So you're going uh, full on Maurice Tillet. You're going French Angel, aren't you? That's that's the goal. Oh, I oh if only if only I had a tumor on my pituitary gland. <laughs> Which. <laughs> I was gonna ask something, but that would that's no, great. no. I I know where it's going. I actually do know what you're thinking. No, don't ask that. We're not talking okay. about that. All right. I know. Well, I, I we're not going any further. Okay. We're not making All any implications. Right. Any any. No. no, no we're just moving not. on. Exactly. So speaking of fashion, right? I want to know the hairstyle that you had, kind of in previous incarnations of the Vod villains, right? It was kind of half fade have swoop i don't even know the terminology for that what 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 did that because i'm a fan of symmetry right and you had the 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 mustache there you had but it was a you you had the swoop on the other side of the arm thingy the andre thingy like was that a conscious look i know no um the the hair was just i was going for uh tim curry in the shadow Okay. Very specifically towards the end of the film, when he right before he jumps through the window. Um, yes. But no, it, it wasn't conscious at all. Uh, it, it was just one of those things I did because I would take some time. I would like look at the hairstyles of the era. That was again the Tim Curry thing kept coming back because I love Tim Curry, and I, it was just what I went with. I never put that much thought into it. it it's shocking when whenever the villain stuff comes up, how little thought was put into any of it. And how really? uh, how oh we we were we had about a week I think it was about ten days more accurately before we were on TV. <sighs> they put us they put it they put us together ten days earlier. We did one practice match at the uh, PC. We did I think two house shows, and then we were on TV the following week. Which I mean, yeah, that we, just tells you everything that you need to know about my wrestling prowess. Because you two, you in English, were one of my favorite tag teams since like Kendrick in London. Yeah, he, in uh, the, 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 there's a lot of assumptions people make about how that's how stuff works, and they don't understand the how much of it is just thrown together, how much of it's done quickly, how much of it. I mean, they we had our. We didn't have an entrance. We didn't have entrance music. We didn't have anything when we went to TV. We had a few offensive maneuvers, a few tag team spots, and that was it. That was all we had. And we went out there. We worked on an entrance. They told us, they picked out some, they gave us a couple different songs to listen to. And we're like, hey, which one of these do you want to use? And that was it. Uh, again, a lot of people don't, I, they assume that, you know, we were working together for months or years. And like, no, they threw that together real quick. And that was after doing nothing with us for like a year. Um, or I think English, English I think started in, in uh, FCW maybe six months before I got there. 
Right. And then they had done the uh, bit with him on TV, which I think was more to get footage for uh, when they were doing that 30 for 30 or uh-huh. whatever it was. or uh, yeah. they, That was more about getting footage for that. And then I don't know if they really had any idea what they were going to do with him after that was over. And then they put him with, they put me and him together. But yeah, a lot of it, um, it again, it's fascinating how much of the process, I, I think James Gunn actually summed it up the other day pretty well. Somebody made a comment. He, somebody said something about uh, the way Marvel films are made and he responded on Twitter and a guy responded to him telling him how it really worked. Like, how, Oh, Marvel just does this. And James Gunn's response was, thank you for telling me about this job I have. T- thank you for telling me inside information about this job I have and you don't. Which is, a lot of it comes down to, it's like, uh, that uh, unfortunately there's such a gap between, I, 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 I'll, I'll throw this in here just because it's a fascinating little, little tidbit. Yeah. I tend to avoid any and all interaction with uh, wrestling media. I make an exception mm-hmm. for you because I like you. Uh, oh, I like you too, Simon. I'm just saying. Uh, but, uh, He's, he's got the shirt on. Um, I literally have this but, and a Bob Villain shirt. So that, those are facts. those are good shirts. They are. Mm-hmm. But um, one of the uh, there's a reporter who was discussing something uh, with it was a long thread on Twitter about um, uh, royalties in WWE and how they were paid out. And for everything that this guy was saying, this again, he's supposed to be a reporter. He's supposed to have facts. He knew nothing. It was like fascinating how much he was saying, knowing nothing. And I finally chimed in with royalties are five percent paid to talent unless otherwise noted in their contract. That five percent is distributed equally amongst members if there is more than one person involved. Which means my merchandise, uh, any of our villains merchandise that was produced for WWE, uh, I would receive two and a half percent off of. English would receive the other two and a half percent. And then if uh, it was something like a NXT, you know, uh, UK tour shirt that we were on, but we were on it with 12 other people, that 5% was being split up between 12 other people. Oh. So, and I just threw that in there and it was weird because he kept talking and like a week later, he noticed that I'd responded to it and it actually answered the question. And, but it was fascinating to me because uh, all I could think was, you know, you, you're ta- like, in any other field, if you're a reporter, you're getting your whole goal is to get facts and information. And I, I can't remember who said this, but the, there's a quote: "A reporter's job isn't to tell people that someone said it was raining and someone said it wasn't. A reporter's job is to stick their head out the window and figure out which is happening." Yeah. And very often with wrestling, you wind up with this whole scenario where it's, you know, well, we heard a story. We have no way of corroborating it. We have no way of knowing if it's true. Uh, we have no one who can confirm or deny it, but we're going to say it. And, and unfortunately, that puts a lot of a lot of quote a lot of stories out, but not a whole lot of information, not a whole lot of facts. And unfortunately, that does feed into this environment of people really believing they. And professional wrestling is still a fairly secretive business. Yeah, you can talk about, it, and people will say, "Well, you people talk about movies." There are. I could go on the computer right now. I could go on my phone and I could order a thousand different books written on the subject of film by people who've studied film, who are professors of film. You can get a degree in film from a university. You can't get a degree in pro wrestling. Right. Every piece of information about pro wrestling out there in the world is second, third-hand information or given directly by someone who was involved, may have been involved, or knew someone that was involved. But it's not standardized. I... I recently, I, I love watching uh, videos on YouTube that are like uh, essays about films, like video essays about films. And I learned about gunfight geography for, for, for the first time of this past year. Wow. I'd never, I'd never heard the term. The idea of if you have one guy over here and one guy over here and they're not both in the shot, guy over here has to be firing this direction and guy over here has to be firing in this direction. So that when you're, con- when you're watching the film, you're subconsciously putting into your mind where they're at on the field. Wow. That you, even if they're not both in the shot, you know guy A is here and guy B is here. But a bad movie, they'll both be firing in the same direction in different shots. And all, so it all of a sudden makes it un- unclear where they physically are from based on e- each other's positioning and where, where they're at with the, with the frame of the camera. And that was crazy because I'd never heard that said. But this is a thing people who study film know. This is a thing you learn in like filmmaking 101. There's nothing like that for pro wrestling. And again, in a lot of cases, you'll have people even giving out information that isn't necessarily accurate or it's 
based on an archaic mindset or a particular region in a specific era. And wrestling is so continually evolving that I can't tell you necessarily what's going to be good in 10 years. I can tell you what I believe in. I can tell you what I enjoy. I can tell you if something appeals to me or not, but I can't necessarily tell you if it's good or bad because that even that there are people who will stand here and tell you it's good if it makes money, but it doesn't make the audience money. It makes the performer money. So I can yeah. see why I would think it was good if it's making me money, but you're, if you're not enjoying it, how could you say it's good just because it's ma- if you don't like transformers, is it a good movie? If it makes a billion dollars, to, to the studio it is, but yeah. would you as an audience member go, I don't know how I feel about this. Let me check the box office. Oh, man, $800 million? Great movie. Love this. I love this. Let's watch this more. Let's watch this again. <laughs> Let's do eight sequels. I love this movie so much. You're never going to hear someone go, hey, man, I saw that new Star Wars movie. How was it? Bro, billion dollars worldwide. Yeah. Okay, yeah. but how was it? Bro, you don't understand, all right? <laughs> Highest grossing movie in U.S. history. Mm-hmm. But how was it? Dude. More showings per day. They had yeah. to add showings. Mm-hmm. You're not telling me if you liked it, though. You're just telling me it made money. Yeah. That and unfortunately, that. It, but that's the sort of thing where information is out, or I sort of, sort of piece of information are out there. So a lot of it can get kind of confusing for people. So they'll see someone like a Pepper Gomez because I'm going to bring this all the way back. Yes. Or a Red Bastine, and they'll see this one thing, and this is all they know. Right. And it's unfortunate because, again, you have someone who might be very talented, very knowledgeable, very, very good at their job. Think about how many guys have have left WWE and you find out they're good wrestlers who wind up being successful other places or who wind up just people. Oh, wow, that guy actually was really good. Mm -hmm. And at a certain point, you have to consider maybe maybe the system is the issue and not the guys. Could be. I mean, that is. Yeah. I mean, you, yeah. one could say that, which I got to say, right? I mean, Saturday, blood sport. Saturday is blood sport. It's, it's here. This is my favorite time of the year. This is my favorite type of wrestling because as an MMA and pro wrestling guy, this is right up my alley. It's just, it, to me, on par, if you're talking about, you know, grappling, whether it be judo, jujitsu, catch wrestling, sambo, what have you, right? And then getting into full-fledged MMA – you know, Eddie Bravo will tell you that EBI, and he's right to an extent, EBI is kind of like the next deal, especially when you get into combat jiu-jitsu, right? Eddie Bravo, Invitational, combat jiu-jitsu, jiu-jitsu with open hand slaps, right? But I, in my estimation, Bloodsport is there, if not more so, because uh, you're getting submissions, you're getting knockouts, right? So you're coming off of a win over Weapon X, Matt Mikowski. Oh yeah, no, and Matt is a Matt is a exceptional competitor. I mean, there's there's a lot of people I've I've been fortunate enough to to face, and Matt is hands down so underrated in his his striking ability. Is I mean, the guy's a BJJ black belt. He knows his way around the mat. He's strong. He's an athlete, and I think that's one of the big uh, defining differences in blood sport is that the competitors are not just combat. Uh, they're not just combatants. They're combat athletes. These are guys who are finely tuned machines and you see it every time they're out there when you see a guy like i mean again cal jack mm-hmm. the man is six foot six 200 i think he's down to 240 uh 250 maybe but he's down from 280 the guy's a monster he monster. was an amateur wrestler for i mean he's one of those guys he was a freestyle wrestler for for oregon state he's a machine you know you see someone like jr kratos again a guy who's been touring for all japan pro wrestling you see someone like uh tom lawler who uh Again, former UFC fighter. These -hmm. guys are not here. They're not competing because of anything other than a love of what they're doing. They are there because they have passion about the combat sport of pro wrestling and competing in the purest form. And the the only thing I've seen close to outside of something like, say, UWFI that Bloodsport can be compared to is Combat uh, combat Sambo in uh, Russia. Yes. And those guys are fighting with, uh, with pads. We mm-hmm. don't got any pads. No. Yep. We also they also don't have to worry about falling off the ring because there, there are no ropes on the uh, no the ring blood sport. Yeah. No, it, and it's and again it's the level of competition is insane and it, it's continually being out there with people who are pushing you and f- causing you to fight harder. I, I made the point about Matt earlier. He, I mean, again, I caught some pretty rough shots to the face. Um, there's actually he hit me with a head kick at one point. You kind of see my legs go. 
<laughs> and I, I actually had to I shoot a double leg at one point because and it was purely on instinct because I was I was not all there. And I knew I was like, if I stay still, that little that little buzzer went off my head. If you stay still, they're gonna call you out. Move. Do any do anything. Anything. Fall into him. Just don't let go. Uh, and I'm, I was able to, and I was able to pull out the win on that one, so it was very fortunate. But it's it's a matter of, for a lot of these guys, this is the only time of year is when they get to do blood sport, when they get to have this level of competition with this quality of, of fighter. And it's definitely, it, it's exciting. You know, it, it's it's exciting to see pure pro wrestling. It's exciting to see how strong pro wrestling is, that the sacred nature of what people like Antonio Inoki did, what people like Billy Robinson did, what people like Carl Gotch did to see that alive and well being carried on by someone like Josh Barnett, who directly got to train with them. And that's something as much as you can say about Josh Barnett, he is possibly the world's purest pro wrestler. Yes. He is one of those guys who has the direct lineage to the finest athletes in the history of the sport. Carl Gotch did a, I think it was a four and a half hour wall sit after having his hip replaced. Mm -hmm. Antonio Inoki went out there and fought the baddest man on the planet at the time, as far as anyone was concerned, Muhammad Ali. You have Billy Robinson, who was just an infamous hooker. He could stretch anyone. Mm -hmm. And all these guys put their knowledge into Josh and Josh handpicks the talent that competes in blood sport. And that should tell, that should tell you everything you need to know about it. Other than the fact that it's live at uh, bloodsport.watch, yes. uh, which you can order it now. And also the fact that, uh, you know, I'm competing there as, as you may have put together. I mean, that's another good reason to watch it because, you know, yeah. I got a cool shirt. I got a cool shirt that you can see right there. That's, mm-hmm. that's a cool shirt. Yeah. It says I'm a yeah. scientist. Yeah. And he's technically brilliant, technically. Which I I am. I was I was once said to be the smartest man in pro wrestling, according to the Bill Demott. So take that with as much value as you want. <laughs> that's, that's I like. I got that's along pretty, with Bill. I don't know. Not not everyone that, did. That's pretty humorous, good sir. Yes, I got along with Bill. I liked him. He, he was he was fine to me. Um, but uh, no, he he once he once said I was the smartest. I might be the smartest man in pro wrestling, but I don't know if that did me any good. It was. He also said that I, I seem like the type of guy I was never going to, I would, he's like, he, he said, I worried him because I seem like the type of guy I wouldn't stand there and punch and kick with you. I'd probably just show up at your house with a brick, like while you were sleeping. Like, I, I'm not going to deny that, but I mean, I, obviously on Bloodsport, I'm going to have to punch and kick with people. So that's. Yeah. The KO is a KO. Oh yeah. And I, I wrestled, uh, this is actually going to be my, uh, my fifth time, uh, facing Tom Lawler. We've, uh, we've fought four other times. I'm, yes. I'm one in three. I'm, I'm one in three. I'm I'm one in three right now with Tom, uh, so it was uh, it, it's always a challenge with him because again this guy's a professional fighter, mm-hmm. he's not giving up a whole lot of size. I'm a little bit heavier and a little bit taller, but not by much, and he has exceptional uh, background. I mean, again, I think people oftentimes undersell how good Tom is. I, I'd say he's probably as far as active wrestlers who've trans who's transitioned from MMA. I'd say he's one of the best, if not the best. Yeah. And I've, I've actually wrestled pretty much everyone on that list that is, has been a major name. Uh, so I, I'd safely say Tom is the one you got to worry about. And I've, I've been prepping for this match for a while. This is, this is when I got told I was going to get to do this. Uh, I knew this wasn't something I could really half ass at all and expect to come out <laughs> with any positive I- result. No, which, you know, it's funny because I was on the BCW Worldwide podcast with uh, uh, the franchise player Brad Blood and the crew, and I had a, a unique theory because we were making our picks. I picked you, right? And it's not just because you're doing the podcast and Lawler's not, but you guys have a history, a unique history in MLW. You are a member of team filthy in ml I, I was I, right? I, I was at one time yes right. um and actually that was what led to our uh that was what led to our third match um and actually we had fought uh, that match was in a uh environment similar to blood sport where it was a no rope match uh we we didn't we the rules were significantly more lax uh actually i i suplexed tom from the floor onto the ring uh that was yeah it was pretty nasty 
I'm yeah. Gonna, <laughs> I, send links. Send links. I'll, I'll send it. It's yeah. But uh, I, 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 I wasn't. I wasn't. I that was one of those matches where I don't know that I did. I, I obviously didn't win, but I uh, I did a lot of damage. That was kind of the, the joy of that one. But we've uh, our three other matches actually hurt, uh, happened with uh, Wrestling Prestige up in our Prestige Wrestling up in uh, Oregon. Is it, yeah. And uh, the last one uh, was pretty. That was that was a rough one for me because uh, 2019 I was I uh, had just a bad run of injuries and going into that match with Tom I uh, I had a really bad bursitis on my elbow I was losing feeling in my hand from a neck injury um, um, yeah pretty much if I I'd actually had lacerated my cornea earlier in the year it was it was pretty rough um, I actually had to take time off after wrestling Tom we I gave everything I had to that match uh, and that was the last time we wrestled which was almost two years ago. I guess about wow. technically eighteen months ago, and it was it was brutal. Um, I think that was that was also when a fan said something to me, and my response was that uh, I think I, I yelled. A fan said something to me. I didn't even hear him, but my response was to tell them that I'd fuck them so hard they'd have to call me daddy. Ooh! If they didn't, I, I said, if you don't shut up, I'm gonna fuck you so hard you'll have to call me daddy. And they, the guy, the guy did not know how to respond to it. I think he just, he just it was one of those where he he didn't even get mad. He just did one of these, like just okay. Yeah. I'm just gonna yeah. no, no, yeah. no, sir. Um, but uh, that that match was pretty rough. Um, also, you can tell it was pre-COVID because I spat on the ref when he asked me if I quit at one point. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, no, it was it was it was it was a rough one. Tom Tom licked a beer off the floor. He hit me with a beer and wound up. Yeah, like I said, it was a really it was a really brutal match and. Uh, I actually had to take time off after it, so this is going to be the first time we've we've actually faced off in uh, eighteen months, and it's it's going to be interesting because at this point, I think there's no other match on the card where the two competitors have actually faced off that many times before yes. uh, Bloodsport. I think everyone else, it's a uh, first time meetings or second time meetings, but that's about it. Uh, so we're we're the only match with a lot with that much history behind it. So it, it's going to be uh, hopefully I've trained hard enough. Um, I've heard some guys say uh, that there's no such thing as overtraining, but there's always that concern in the back of your mind that you may have uh, may have exa- uh, exasperated an injury or set something up that could be taken advantage of. Yeah. Uh, you, I'm, I'm trying to drink enough water. You know, you want to make sure your your organs are healthy as well. Because, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that, anyone who's seen a, anyone who's seen a boss root and fight knows, you know, you you're you can take a guy down with a good body shot. It's not unheard of. Liver shot, liver shot, liver shot is what I'm saying. Dang it, dang it, the dang it, the dang. Why would you try this with me? It's, it's... <laughs> uh, no, those, oh, those old Boss Root and self-defense videos are the best. Yes. Oh yeah. Oh, even he's, he's got a he's got his bot system now. He's like beating the shit out of oh, like yeah. this, uh, whatever. Like this is what you do, stiff as a board. This wah, wah, fucking beating the shit out of it. I love it. <laughs> he's amazing. He actually had a really good. Uh, I, I feel like Boss Rutten is the only guy that truly got robbed by pro wrestling. Yes. Because if he had been if he had been five years younger, I think he would have been one of the biggest stars in New Japan history. He, he had a he had a match with even as it was uh, him and Koji Kanemoto that was amazing. Yes. Um, yes. But I I genuinely believe if if Boss Rutten had been born five years or uh, later, he would have been a huge star in Japan. I, I mm-hmm. it was unfortunate that he'd had he'd done so much time in MMA. He'd done so much time in uh, UWFI or not. Was he in UWFI? I think he did some stuff. He's in, oh, in Pancreas. He was in Pancreas, yeah. He did so much time in Pancreas that I, I feel like by the time he got into New Japan, his his peak years were not in, in front of him anymore. Right. And I, I just, it's such a shame because that is a, I mean, and he, he had the charisma too. He was very, he was very yes. personal. He's a very fun guy to hear talk. Still is. Yeah, still is. No, he, he, and it's, it's, it's a shame, but again, I mean, help. There's a guy we need to get down at Bloodsport. I mean, I, not no. maybe not as a fighter, but I would love to have him on commentary. If we could get Barnett? Boss Rutten on commentary, oh Barnett and Rutten, oh that oh be that'd great. be a commentary team. Oh, uh. okay. I, you know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna message the both of them. That's hey, I, hey. I, I don't know what I can do, but I'm gonna put it out there. I think I, I think that needs to happen. I mean, don't don't get me wrong. Max Brito is a great great announcer. No, absolutely amazing but, uh, but, commentator. But I, I would absolutely love to have Boss Rutten calling up one of my matches. I think that would be I could I could lose a thousand times if I got Boss Rutten calling the match. That would just be Yeah. That would be fun. Yeah, absolutely. Which I in terms of my pick, right? The reason why I'm picking you is because 
what was the reason why everybody was into Austin, right? Basically, he was – Because they were that, racist. Oh, well, that too. That too. I, I mean, bionic redneck and what have you. But uh, He also he, beat his wife. Yeah, that's that too. And fled uh, police for two months. Oh, yeah, I'll bring that up. Oh, yeah, I mean, that's – But anyway – uh, maybe you might want to pick another metaphor. I'm just going to say no, it. I'm just, you might no, want to pick another metaphor. But, no, but, but the reason why I picked you is everybody's had a leader or a boss, right? That they mm -hmm. had not best, you know, I mean, they made a movie called Horrible Bosses, right? And it's they made two of them. Did they? Oh. They made it. Oh, you think that's bad? They made a Bad Wife's Christmas movie. Or bad Moms. Bad Moms Christmas. That exists. My wife is literally watching it right now. She's, why? Divorce her. Wow. <laughs> uh, yeah, you're, you're not going to answer that. <laughs> Look, I'm just saying. I'm just saying. If there's if there's a reason to get a divorce, bad a bad bad mom's Christmas is a reason. There is. I mean, it's no the five year engagement. I, I came to the conclusion rom coms are basically bad movies about bad people doing bad things for two hours that people love. That's that's. It, Except for the, the, the uh, what was it? The, what was that one? Where it was, uh, I can't remember. It's a Christmas one. It's the one where uh, Rick from uh, from Walking Dead tries to hook up with Natalie Portman, even though she's, they're not Natalie Portman. Uh, who's British Natalie Portman? What's her name? Uh, good Lord. Is it is it the chick from Titanic? No. No, no, no. The one, the one from Star Wars. It was British Natalie Portman. She was literally like Natalie Portman's double in that movie. Uh, Kira Knightley? Kira Knightley, thank you. Yeah, there we go. Where, where he's, he's trying to he's trying to marry he's trying to hook up with Kira Knightley, even though she's married to his best friend. Oh, I've seen that, that whole one. movie's messed up. But yes, yeah, about uh, uh, Love Actually, that's the one. That's the only that's the only good romantic comedy because it's just terrible, and they just don't hide it. They're, they're like, oh yeah, everyone in this movie's awful. Everyone's a bad person. They're all doing bad things. Enjoy. <laughs> oh my wife thank literally gets there. Oh, thank you, Simon. <laughs> what? Bad Bob's Christmas is terrible. It's a terrible movie. <laughs> he said it's horrible. Bad Bob's Christmas, honey. It's like can't watch it. That's from former WWE NXT tag team champion Simon Dodge. Just saying. I live in his I'm just there are better things on Netflix to watch than Bad Mom's Christmas. I think there's another one that's like Bad Moms, but it's not Bad Moms. The, the the Cecil Hotel documentary. That's one I'm gonna go a deep dive into. Like that, the chick in the wa the water tank. And I the, they got us. Night soccer. Oh yeah. Yeah, it's, oh yeah. I mean, that's what I'm gonna. That's go something. Into. I'm, it's something. Hey, that, right? it's it, it's something, right? It's mm -hmm. not. I mean, it's it, it's one of those it's one of those deals where again, I, there's I I'm very particular about the movies I like, and I think that's why it's so hard for people to recommend movies to me. Yeah. I, I don't watch things I don't want to see. I guess is the best way to put it. If I'm like, does this look good? No, I know it doesn't. I'm, I'm not gonna watch it. I'm not gonna be like, oh hey, you know what? Surprised the only one that surprised me, Door of the Explorer, great movie. I actually did not mind. Unironically. Uniro ironically. No, it, no, it was absolutely a good movie, and yeah, I was like, I, I actually like the, uh, because I liked it as a kid. The Legends of the Hidden Temple, right? Because yeah. you get your learning and your physical exercise. I'm like. That's the shit. Fuck, I wanted to be a bear, blue barracuda. I wanted to be a fucking silver snake. Like, that's it. So when they did the remake, I wasn't mad at it. I know it was, like, fucking corny as shit, but I wasn't mad at it. Oh, yeah. no, and again, it's... You can be self-aware when... The, the hardest thing with translating a property that's, you know, at that point, 20 years old and meant for kindergartners mm -hmm. is that there's nothing really to translate... So all you can do is sort of take the idea. It was what happened with Dragnet. Uh, all yes. parody at its core comes from a place of love. Good parody comes from a place of love. If you've ever seen uh, Lego Batman, the reason mm -hmm. it works is because they clearly, the people who made that movie love Batman and are familiar enough with Batman to where they can make fun of it accurately. Mm -hmm. uh, when, you see some, when you see something like Epic Movie, where clearly all they had to go on was the trailers of these films, <laughs> it, there's a reason why it's bad. Yes. You know, no, no, no one's sitting around going like, "Man, why isn't there a Paul Blart 3? No, yeah. It's like I've seen Die Hard. I don't need to see bad, not funny Die Hard. Yeah, Oof. yeah. Wasn't 
I just don't. I, I heard Kevin Smith or uh, Kevin James is a dick. So I just like I will not him and and Weird Al. Even though I used to like Weird Al, but I I've had so many bad. Like stories on them that I just can't. I fucking like. If you're an asshole, fuck it. I'm not going to do that. Now, are you sure Weird Al is an asshole and he's not just being weird? No, he's an asshole. He's a fucking oh, okay. asshole. I will not acknowledge your existence. Oh, fucking uh, Paul Rubens, Pee Wee Herman. Fuck you, sir, too. Bam. Well, that one I that one I get. That one I love you. I the I will I will give credit to Paul Rubens for reprising his role as a vampire from Buffy the Vampire Slayer for that one episode of uh, What We Do in the Shadows. That was I credit where credit is due. That was a lot of guys didn't show up for that. You know, Tom Cruise didn't show up for it. Yeah. Robert Pattinson didn't show up for it. Right. Brad Pitt. Brad Pitt didn't show up for it. Kiefer Sutherland wanted to, but he couldn't do it for scheduling reasons. But you know, like if you get Tilda Swinton and you can't get you know and and. You're Paul Rubens. You got to show up. Like you can't yeah. just say no. Yeah, that's just a rule. Yeah. That's like a rule in SAG. If you're in a SAG, if you're in SAG, and they're like, "Hey, did Tilda Swinton show up?" Paul Rubens, you got to show up. You don't get to say no. <laughs> Which isn't a wrestler. I want to say the Rock is not head of SAG right now. Are they? No, no, but he's 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 a member. Okay. I the SAG is I. Just a re- weird sidebar because clearly nothing came of it because people only care about pro wrestlers for about 15 minutes and the second then then when that time passes they forget about us. SAG has had an option to have pro wrestlers uh, because they appear on episodic television weekly as members for 30 years. Mm-hmm. The reason wrestlers don't have a union like SAG is because SAG said no, you gross. That's it. That's the reason. So when SAG was jumping all over Thea Trinidad's uh, posts about yeah. WWE, I kept, I was just waiting for someone to be like, hey, why have you been refusing wrestlers? Because wrestlers have tried to join SAG and they're told they don't count. That the credit you have for being on Monday Night Raw or SmackDown, no matter how long you were there, does not count. Ooh. Yeah. So, and if you notice, it's been. What three, four months, maybe six? God, I don't even remember when that happened. When did that, that happen? Was that like about June, six, that, that July? Was, yeah, yeah, that was around the summer when she six. got let go. Yeah. yeah. So in the six months since then, if SAG said anything about we're going to let wrestlers in, that's all they have to do. That's all they have to do. Mm-hmm. If you are a mem- if you are appearing weekly on episodic television, you qualify. That's all they have to do. And if you notice, not a word. Awesome. Andrew Yang. Yeah. Oh, he, he gets all candidate. Yeah. gets all riled up about it and then does nothing. Mm-hmm. Th- twice, like two different times, he got riled up about it. Mm-hmm. And even wrestling fans, for years, when someone like a Mike Sanders or a Raven would bring a suit against WWE over employment stuff or concussions, they just laugh. Oh, Mike Sanders, he sucks. He's a jabroni. Oh. And then they wonder why these guys, like, oh, why don't wrestlers have unions? Why do you think? Because you guys were too busy laughing at them trying to get them. Because rather than being supportive, like any other fan would be of anything, you decided to shit on them, the guys who tried to get that stuff going, and then got act shocked when no one else wants to try. Like it's, yeah. I was a fan of it, above average Mike Sanders. That fucking, that dude was awesome. In an industry where people are braggadocious, he was very, very minimalist with his opinion of himself. He didn't claim to be better than everyone, just, you know, he was a C plus. Yes. Which, he wasn't, I mean, you know. He was like, I'm not better than I'm not better than Eddie Guerrero. I'm not better than than Dean Malenko, but you know, I'm better than that guy, that one guy over there. I'm better than that guy you saw on WCW Saturday night. No one is better than El Dandy. And who are you to question him? No, he's a jam up guy and a hell of a professional. I mean, Yes, we're getting Bret Hart references. Yes. Oh, I, w- I was, I randomly Googled El Dandy while in WWE for, I was looking for a photo for something and I was upset because a photo of the VOD villains actually came up in the El Dandy search. And I was like, oh, hell no, we don't doubt El Dandy. How dare you put us here? All right. This is no, we, we are. Google is not going to claim we doubt El Dandy. I, I'm not okay with that. Uh, what? Oh, it, it, it's one of those weird things where, again, it was like just whatever Lucha website, you know, had printed had a story 
and our faces were there. And they're like, oh, and then there was also one for El Dandy. And I was like, oh, okay, unrelated to anything, but it, that's just a weird thing that happened once. I want to say we like, have talked I, so little about wrestling. I I strain. <laughs> we're, we're we're pushing two hours and have done nothing. <laughs> we did a lot. We had a, a, you an English story. Uh, you had Dusty's funeral, popping Corey Graves. Like, I I broke I broke Corey Graves. I didn't pop him. He was he was okay. not happy. I did that. Okay. All right. Well, even so, don't let the uh, as Conan says. The, the, don't let if the you get in the way of a good story, kid. <laughs> No, you you want you want a you want a story of popping someone where they couldn't control the laughter. This is, I, I won't I won't say who said this. I will simply tell you who laughed. It was okay. me, the the unmentioned person, and Kevin Owens. We were on the bus when WWE did its loop in Tokyo uh, while I was there. And person not being mentioned is telling a story about being out at a bar with a bunch of the guys. And he's like, yeah, there's this girl there. I guess she did porn in Japan. I, she kept saying bukkake. I think it was the only English word she knew. And I waited for a second. I just went, one of the only English words she knew. It was the only Japanese word you knew. <laughs> and he goes to say something back to me. And he stops. He's like, damn it. And Owens just starts losing his shit laughing. Like, he couldn't believe. He's like, it's the only fucking Japanese word you know. <laughs> but it was one of those ridiculous. It was, it, I, you know. I'm not a big joke guy. Again, I all I mostly am just trying to make myself laugh. I'm not trying to make other people laugh. And I wasn't even trying to make anyone laugh with this. It was just one of those like, dude, you understand that's a Japanese word, right? Like, it, it, it's it's like it, there was a terrible movie with uh, Ricky Lake where she played a pregnant woman who was masquerading as like some rich guy's kid or rich guy's daughter, uh, yeah, fiance. Mrs. Winterborn. Yeah, where, where like his her husband her husband died or whatever. Yeah, Mrs. but there, there's a. They take her out to see a Rolls Royce. She goes, wow, this is like the Cadillac of cars, right? It was in the trailer. That's why I know this. Mm-hmm. But it, it was one of those moments where it was like, the Cadillac is the Cadillac of cars. This is a fucking Rolls Royce. Like, this is... Right. Yeah. But it, it, that, was, that, was the, that, was the, that was the big laugh. That was the, that was the big pop. No, Corey Graves absolutely, I think, has held a grudge against me for that joke because it, may, it did literally kill. He's going to die five years early because of that joke. He's going to be I mean, clenching his fist, cursing my name on his deathbed because he should have lived five more years. That joke hadn't robbed him of life. It, it's worth it, though. I think it's worth it. I, I mean, fuck. It, I, I, it, it is because it is, it's, again, you so rarely get such a perfect setup, you know? Yes. You get, oh, you, yeah. You, yeah it's, it's just you don't always get the perfect setup for a line, and it's just... It, you, it, you have to use it. And it would have taken five years off of your lifespan and still a, per, a part of your soul if, again, that moment would never come again. I mean, how many times oh, no, have you it, what, Glacier since? Maybe once or twice. Okay. So, again... <laughs> but but it, was, it wasn't in that said. environment. It, was, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't in a moment where you could pull that line off. You have to be around someone. It's There's a joke on The Simpsons where he... Uh, Homer cracked a line about uh, Lenny and Carl running with George Bush, and I oh, guess they're barking up the wrong bush, and it pans up to his head. There it is, Homer. Wittiest thing you're ever going to say, and no one was around to hear it. Fuck. I mean... <laughs> yeah, that, how terrible would that have been? Yeah. I tell that joke to myself. I'm like looking around like, anyone? Anyone? Uh, nope. Anyone? Oh, <laughs> man. Bueller. Bueller. <laughs> Just saying. Fucking A. That's, I mean, but that's great. That's great. Which, I mean... And it's funny because how little of this side of your persona do we actually see in Bloodsport? Because you're an actual ass kicker, and I, you... <laughs> I, I like to think of myself as like I, I like to think of myself as a less talented Katsuyoshi uh, uh, Sakuraba, uh, because I, I this was brought up because someone actually mentioned when I um I brought I wore the mask out to the ring at uh, Bloodsport three, uh, and my whole point was. Sakuraba demonstrated you can have personality, you can be entertaining, you can be fun, yeah. but when the bell rings, you have to be ready to kill. Um, yeah. You have to, you can't, you can't go into, a, you can You can bring all the entertainment, all the pizzazz. I mean, Sakuraba would come out to the ring dressed as Vader, dressed as the Road Warriors. Yes. He'd have two other guys dressed the same as him, so you weren't sure which one was which. Yeah. And, but at the end of the day, when the bell rang, Sakuraba was ready to snap your arm. He wasn't going to to be a joke when the bell rang. And I think that speaks to the power of pro wrestling because 
no matter who you are, no matter what you are, for the other 99% of the day, the second you get on that mat, the second the bell rings, you're a machine, you're a killer, you're, you're at war. You're facing another human being in a sacred space where you're going to do combat for no greater reason than pride. Mm -hmm. And that's a beautiful thing. That is, I mean, when people say pro wrestling is art, that is what it should mean. That is what pro wrestling being art is, is a pure moment of human interaction of combat where no ill will is formed. Nothing is held on to You're a vessel of violence. You're just mm -hmm. a, a body committing horrible acts. But when the, when the bell rings, you shake hands, you move on. It's not done out of ill will. It's done if anything out of respect. Mm -hmm. And, uh, to, there, there's a uh, vile but impressive film called Ichi the Killer. Oh, yes, uh, it's a set of Ichi uh, fucking yeah, series. Uh, ta, uh, Takashi Miike. Yeah? And, yeah, there, there's a line, because uh, one of the characters, uh, Tad, uh, Tadanobu Asano plays a, a character named Kakihara who's a sadist. Mm -hmm. And there's a scene where he's, he's literally hung up on a, a chain and he's getting punched by a woman and he finally gets tired of everything and takes his just gets himself off of the uh, chain and says, there's no love behind your strikes. His whole point is that you need to care. You yeah. need to care about what you're doing. You can't just hit me to hit me. You have to be trying to kill me. You have to have intent. And he's describing it as love, but what it ultimately is, is that intent mm -hmm. that you're not holding back. You're truly trusting that this person can withstand this shot. And that level of violence, that level of, of, combat again is something that's truly is amazing and when you say pro wrestling is art that's the art the art isn't you know a flashy costume or uh, a high you know high art or high uh, high fashion photography it's that pure just unadulterated violence Yes, and I can't fucking wait, which I gotta ask, right? Because uh, the reason why I feel that you're gonna win against Tom Lauder is, and by KO, because what better statement to make over your 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 former stable leader than to knock him out, right? Like, to live vicariously for anybody that has well, had the, a grudge with their boss. So... Well, the key with, the key with the issue with someone like Tom is, again, he... He's someone who can strike and he's someone who can grapple. So the issue is to be really, you have to be ready to change it up at any moment. That's really the key. You look at a guy like that. If I stand there and try and punch and kick with him, even if I can outpower him by any, by any means, Tom can still out grapple. He, he can still go to the grappling game. He can still get on top that way. Conversely, if I try and grapple with him, he's got, he's a black belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. He can absolutely go on the mat. So I'm going to have to contend with that. So the wisest strategy for me is going to be not necessarily the specifics, but the general idea of being able to shift between the two seamlessly. Yeah. If, if he's starting to rely on the grappling, I have to be ready to stop him there. If he's going to start focusing on the strikes, I have to be ready to take him down because the one thing I do have on him is a little bit of size. I'm a little bit heavier, a little bit taller. And I found in the past that when I can focus on that is usually when I do the best. So, mm -hmm. and again, it's, I'm, I'm in the unique position. Uh, he and I both are of having scouted our opponent via actual competition. Whereas a lot of the guys are going to have footage, they're going to have interviews, they're going to have, you know, they can watch all they want, but until you get in there, you really experience it for yourself. You don't know. Um, I, I make a lot of references to film and because I do feel like more than philosophy in the modern era, it expresses human ideology and ideas in a uh, palatable manner. The, the bit in uh, Dark Knight, when the Joker explains why he likes using knives. Yes. Because you get to know someone. And there's a level of knowledge Tom and I have of each other because of the number of matches we've had that I don't think a lot of people have going into this. So, whereas something like Jeff Cobb and Chris Dickinson, you know is going to be a fight. Cobb's got the amateur background. Cobb's a, a suplex machine. Uh, Dickinson is a striker. He's got the karate background you know what, where their focuses are and you know where the, how they're going to try and win. With me and Tom, we're trying to win based on our experience with each other, not just our own ability. And I think that's going to be something that we, we're, it's going to be a unique fight for sure. And I'm obviously going out there with the intent of winning, but I'm also not foolish enough to think that 
I've got this in the bag. I know that it's going to take everything I got because as it stands with a one in, with a one in uh, one in three record, yeah. I, I have to know that, uh, that it's not, that's not going to be an easy fight, even that it's going to take everything I got. And thankfully uh, I, I think I've got more than enough. I do too. I do too. Which I, I got to ask, right? For those that are still pondering, they're on the fence whether they are going to purchase the Bloodsport four and five because you can five get a is another deal. one. Yes, yeah, you in, can in get the, a special the deal, right? And get an even T-shirt for like under a hundred bucks. Like that's a it's a hell of a deal. But folks that are it's a hell of a deal. I, I will say this: I, I've. I've been fortunate enough to hear some rumblings about the card for five. I'm not going to divulge anything that I've heard because I have no idea how true any of it is. I will say you want five. You want four. Four is going to be great, but you know what you're getting with four. You don't know what you're getting with five, but let me tell you, there are, I've heard some rumblings of several competitors that actually are not competing at four that will be present for five. Mm. So there are some unique matches. So this isn't just going to be a shuffling of the deck. There's going to be some unique matches you could not have seen on four that you will get to see on five. And that's something I think a lot of people need to be aware of because I mean, the the events are being run so close together that obviously for the audience, we're doing so much promotion for four, but that may have, and that may affect how five goes admittedly. If I, if I get, you know, if I get my teeth knocked in (laughs) or if Tom gets an arm broken, obviously it's going to affect the card for five. But I, I will say some of what I've heard is it's, it's not going to be something you want to miss. It's not going to be something you want to wait and be on the fence about. It's something you need to understand right now is going to be more than worth your time, more than worth your money. And if that, if I'm wrong, feel free to blast me in public. No one will be mad at you. <laughs> I wouldn't because you're a damn professional wrestler, professional ass kicker. So again, I'm, I'm, gonna I'm just professional. And uh, I mean, literally a scientific wrestler that is technically it's honest. It's on on a a shirt, so you know, it's it's legally binding. It is, 100%. That's it. Also, here's here's a fun fact about this shirt that I I don't know how many people notice. Um, I I, I put five stars on it. (laughs) So if anyone ever says, I never got five stars, they'll be like, oh, yeah, it's on a shirt. I got five on a shirt. Yeah, you can refer to me. Just saying. Right? You can't. You are one of three people that owns a shirt, so that's... It's it's a limited. Oh no, it's not limited. I got I got plenty, but I hang hang on. <laughs> this isn't all of them. This is not all of them. This is one of the bags. I have like two. Yeah, there, there's a lot. These this is just I think. Uh, these are just I think the mediums. These are just the mediums. Wow. This is my office. I don't know if you put that together. This, this, so that's. I, I kind of figured as such. I have all my stuff in here. My, Oh yeah, I have a quarter. But yeah, I, I will say it's. I have a whole room, but it's just not the best room. It's, but again, it's like it, when you when you have a house, you're like I I don't want to, I don't want to waste the space, and I don't want to be out in the garage where it's you know it's hot. It's Florida, so it's I don't I don't want to be in 150 degree garage trying to film. I'll 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 do it in here. I, I can put up with that. Yeah, I got a fan, like vaulted ceiling. It's it's nice. It's not bad, not bad at all. Yeah. Which, nice. I mean, fuck, I can't wait for Bloodsport. But b- before we go, I got to ask, right? Um, you were a tag team in NXT, right? Were there yes. other tag teams around? And, and which ones would they be? Uh, yeah, no, there was a, uh, at the time, it's it's remembered now a lot more clearly, but I remember at the time, I don't know how many people picked up on it. The Ascension was at that point the only established tag team in NXT. Mm-hmm. They had had an issue. It wasn't intentional. It had just sort of happened by accident. Where um, Neville uh, Pock, his initial tag partner Oliver Gray, uh, tore his ACL. Right. They were the first NXT tag team champions, and they immediately had to vacate the belts. Mm-hmm. Then the Wyatt family, I believe, won the belts, and they got called up. Right. And then Neville and I think Corey Graves won the belts in a tournament. And then I think they lost the belts to the Ascension. And Corey, I think at that point, uh, shortly after that, his uh, in-ring career came to an end because of concussions. Uh, and uh, and Pac went on to work in the, uh, the singles division. Right. So the whole the whole period of the Ascension 
uh, just crushing, you know, sort of a cobbled together teams was not intentional. It was just sort of necessity because they had no tag teams. They, they had lost a lot of their tag teams just sort of by happenstance. So at the time, there wound up being uh, a bunch of teams that got put together. There was myself in English. There was American Alpha. There was uh, the, uh, the Revival. So there, there was a lot of teams coming up at the time, uh, Lucha Dragons. And a lot of it was trying to sort of fill in that gap because they really did not have tag teams. Like they, it was one of those weird things where they had signed all these singles guys. I think at that point, it, uh, NXT had something like 86 people in under contract. It's probably closer to like 150 now. I don't yeah. even know. But uh, but they, uh, they had uh, 86 people under contract, but they were all signed to singles guys. They hadn't signed any tag teams. So... Nothing was prepackaged. Nothing. They had to put everything together. They had to figure it out. Um, they had tried. I think at one point, even before Jordan and Gable were actually teaming, they were doing Jordan and uh, Ty Dillinger. Uh, uh, yes, Sean I remember Spears. that. Yes, I remember that. Uh, so, uh, so that was so. There was a lot of uh, mix and match, and for whatever reason, the the they didn't run with those two as a team, which is weird, but. Um, I think worked out better for Jordan in the long term, and really worked out better for Ronnie for uh, for Sean because he got Sean. obviously he eventually got the, the ten gimmick, and then he moved on to do uh, to work for uh, AEW. Yeah. Um, that that actually was kind of that one tickled me a little bit because I remember when he uh, asked for his release, people were like, "Oh, what's he thinks? Why would AEW want him?" And all I could think was, "You guys know he's like Cody Rhodes' best friend, and they were tag team champions in OVW, right? Like you you guys know that, don't you?" <laughs> You, you think Cody's not going to find a job for him? I mean, if yeah. if Spears and Spears is a solid talent, like he was he's not, he tremendous. wasn't a he wasn't a bad get by any means. But so it was just fascinating that people were thinking that that was going to be like, oh no way, bro, they're not going to hire him. No, way. I actually had a conversation with a with a friend of mine where he thought they wouldn't pick up the revival just because of obviously everything, the pandemic, and I was like, they're going to grab him. They, the Shad Khan is not hurting for money. He's not going to be like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I know I've sunk all this money into your company, son, but. These two guys, that's, that's that's a bridge too far. We can't pay them. I'm sorry. Can't bring them in right now. Can't do it. Sorry. That wasn't right. going to happen. They, they weren't going to. And I think they were even, even they didn't even have a 90 day because their contracts just expired. They weren't uh, released. Right. So I, I think they were only out of, they were only off TV for a month. And then they mm-hmm. got, before they got brought in, it wasn't that long. But, uh, that was a really interesting era just for the NXT tag team division because it was like the division kind of got born relatively quickly, like over a period of maybe three months, they wound up, they went from having no tag teams to having almost too many. Wow. Fuck. Yeah. That's, that's, that's crazy. But that just shows you how the system could fucking go, man. Well, well the system was kind of uh, always suffered from, it still suffers from this issue. Uh, well, not so much now actually, but it suffered from it for a long time, which was, NXT was such a uh, island unto itself right. that they would their top talent, the people who had the highest prospects at the time, were the ones that were being focused on on TV. But those were also the ones that were most likely to get called to the main roster. Mm-hmm. So you were in a position where they wound up having something like, at one point, I think they had seven people uh, that they were on the cusp of bringing to TV. But they were also seven people that were like the main parts of NXT television. So if you pull all of them up, all of a sudden you don't have anyone on your TV show. Mm-hmm. So there was a lot, it caused a lot of scheduling issues because there are people they wanted to bring up for TV earlier and they wound up having to wait or they, excuse me, or they, uh, it was like, Oh, well, this guy's got a title. We can't have to just drop the title. So he's got, we can't bring him up. Um, and it, it was just, it was bad planning because the idea is generally you want to have about a 30 year talent on TV that you can bring up the main roster and then the other two thirds need to be people that are going to be in NXT at varying levels. Mm-hmm. Like if you had guys who are going to be ready for the main roster today, guys who are going to be ready for the main roster in a year, and guys who are going to be ready for the main roster in three years, that's ideal. Because that right. way, what happens? You, when that when the, those guys are made, ready for the main roster, they get called up right now. Cool, guys who are going to be ready in a year, put them in the main event. It'll give them time to work it out. Yeah. Guys that are going to be ready in three years, you move them up. And the guys that you're still trying stuff with, you have at the bottom. Like it, it's the ideal position, right? But again, it was the it was the exact opposite of that. It was just if you're on TV, you're going to be the, you're, you're it's because you're ready to go to TV. Okay, well that's a problem though because if they call me up, you know you're you just lost your angle. You just I mean I think that happened with Roman Reigns. I think he uh, yeah. he won I think a number one contenders tournament, 
and then he got called up to the main roster yep. doing a completely different gimmick. And then he had to go back down to NXT with the Shield gimmick to actually have the match that he he'd won the right to. And at that point, everyone knew he wasn't winning because right. it was like he's got to be on Raw, you know? Yeah, yeah. So it's a lot of the time it was it was really poor planning, and I think they got away from it. But it's mostly because NXT is so visible now that it's a little bit easier to plan that stuff. But it also does speak to the specialness of the era and how like there there you go back and you look through that um, 2013 to 2017 about NXT is a really unique place, and I, I think it's it's kind of sad how much of it's changed. To where it's just another, it's just another brand now, you know. Just like everything, like ECW brand, everything, everything. If there's one thing we're good at in wrestling, it's ruining stuff that's good. That's the only of place. It. I mean, WrestleMania to me is where you know AJ Styles and Nakamura could go to die, and no mention of it. The dream match, the allure. Yeah. Just. just well, yeah. because again, it's well, a dream, dream matches are never as good as you think because it's always going to be a dream. It's yeah. always going to be your imagination. Your imagination will always be better. Again, I make a lot of movie references. I, I actually start saying it more recently because I get self conscious about how much I do it. But but uh, the uh, high fidelity, no sex anyone is having is as good as the sex you're having in my mind right now. When he's describing thinking about his girl, his ex girlfriend sleeping with. Uh, Tim Robbins. Tim Robbins, yeah, absolutely. And, and that, and that's kind of, but that's kind of how dream matches are. They're never, they can't be as good as they are in your head. And yeah. even then, people tend to think of dream matches in a very odd way. We're like, oh man, I want to see these two people wrestle. It's like, well, those two people are not compatible. What you, what you like in a Big Show match and what you like in a uh, Giant Silva match are not the same thing. So if you put those two in the ring, it's not going to be the match you want. Uh, giant Silva actually. Had if I can mention MMA. Giant Silva, I will. I'll... Yes, he actually had a fucking MMA he got, career hey. in Japan. <laughs> Former why. GHC heavyweight champion, current yes. GHC tag team champion, Takashi Sagura beat Giant Silva in a match. That, yes, and that... is... Sagura, That's man. True. Let me tell you, that guy. Yeah. <laughs> That's no. fucking no. true. Oh my god. I can't believe! Oh shit, man. Um, I, oh no, I I know all sorts of yeah. No, you, no, I can't. You, I'm just gonna say I I've been doing this for so long. I basically know every a lot of weird stories. I I surprised Brett Lauderdale because I keep trying to get him to bring in Mike Levy. Ah, oh, nice, yeah. The White Lion. I yes. I just I I just want to see the I if if you're not familiar with the story, anyone watching this or listening to this. Mike Levy was an independent wrestler from like West Virginia or mm-hmm. North Carolina. He was a deathmatch guy. He he basically kept going on the IWA Mid South message boards in like 2005, maybe, trying to get booked in the King of the Deathmatch tournament. And as a joke, they booked him in the Queen of the Deathmatch tournament and actually gave him Mickey Knuckles in the opening round. Yes. And he was not safe, stiffed the hell out of her. He actually mm-hmm. headbutted her so hard she developed a, a bruise on her forehead bruise. during the match. Yeah. And basically the whole thing broke down into Mickey just hitting him with everything known to man. The, everything. Mm-hmm. And after the match is over, Tank, who was this big, like, 300-plus pound guy, and Devin Moore, I think was the other one, came out and, like, legit stomped this guy's head into a ladder. Uh, they hit him with a kendo stick a bunch of times. And I guess at one point he was trying to file charges and mm-hmm. supposedly he got told, oh no, brother, it's just an angle. We're going to bring you back in later. And he dropped the go. charges and they never booked him again. <laughs> but Brett, Brett was surprised I knew who that was. And I was like, I, it's like I've, I've been in a, I was an independent wrestler for you know 12 years before WWE signed me. Like I, You'd be surprised by the stuff I've heard and seen and know about. Uh, yeah. But yeah, you which, had a last question. You had, you had another which, question. Which the, 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 the stories right um obviously we we lost a huge pillar in our community in brody lee john huber so as somebody that toiled the independent circuit prior to wwe as well as having some you know main roster dealings did did you have any interaction with the brody and and do you have a story if, if you had i i had a story i i okay i'm gonna tell this story it was all in good fun. It was a, it was a running gag. If you ever commented Brody on looking like he was in better shape, like he dropped some weight or something, 
he'd as a joke he'd flex he'd go hey you know clembuterol which is a uh, clembuterol is a for those people who aren't aware it's a steroid um <laughs> it's de- it's generally prescribed for um people with uh, asthma right. but uh, it, uh, it's a lot of bodybuilders use it for uh i think it's it's good for cutting or something like that I, but he it was just sort of a joke that that was his response because it was so over the top because brody had obviously a natural physique he was mm-hmm. just a big dude he worked out, but he was never, you know, you're never going to mistake him for Mr. Universe. Right. So one day we were in the trainer's room on a house show. Um, it's before the event. And it's me, Brody, one of the trainers, and uh, a guy from the State Athletic Commission. And I don't remember what was said to me, but my response was, oh, you know, Club Roll. And Brody just, like, covers his face and bolts from the room because he's laughing. Because I just said that in front of someone from the Athletic Commission, which is basically the worst person you can make a steroid joke about in front of. And afterwards, the, guy, the trainer actually came up to me. And he was like, "The doctor is like, yeah, please, 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 don't ever do that again. Don't, don't. They're they're really hard on us about that stuff. A lot of these guys are like they're paranoid. They think everyone who works here is on the gas. Please don't ever do that again." And I was like, "Okay, I won't do it again." But Brody just lost it to where he like had to leave the room because he couldn't control how hard he was laughing. Uh, and I, I was just like, you know, they're not going to fire me for making a joke about steroids, so I just did it. But it, it was, yeah, that was that was the big one. Um, other things, it would be like he, he would randomly do Dana Dana Brooks flexing in the middle of matches on house shows. And it, so if you were watching him like, in, a, yes. in a match on a house show, he'd turn, yeah, he turned to hard cam and he'd just start doing the, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he'd start doing the double tap the snaps they do the whole thing and it was just to make himself laugh but he would do it with this the intense brody lee face he would yeah. he wouldn't he wouldn't just do it like as, as pantomime he would really go for it it was it was always hilarious so those are the two that always stood out um because and again it was just because one was it was so it was just so consistently ridiculous and the other because it was such a i'm gonna fire out the worst possible thing i could say I, I've, I've joked before that i have the best worst luck in pro wrestling that if you can, th- that I, I'm, I'm the if, metaphorically speaking in pro wrestling, I'm the guy that could fall into the desert, or I could, I'm the guy that could be lost in the desert and drowned in the one puddle of water he finds. Like that's, I, I, I really do have the best worst luck. Um, I'd actually there's uh, even at Starcast, I wound up in a random like green room and I made a joke about something to the one person in there, and it turned out the guy I made the joke to about the subject I made the joke about was the podcast co-host of the guy I made the joke about. Completely Ooh. randomly, <laughs> and it was an offhand joke. It wasn't inspired by anything. It was just like, "Oh, hey, it could be worse. It could be that, right?" And they were like, "Yeah, um, I'm his best friend. I'm a, I host a podcast with him." I'm like, oh, good thing you don't know who I am. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I oh no, no, no. That's why I start giving out eight by tens to Steve Blackman, and that's some like, "Yeah, I'm Steve Blackman. Nice to meet you. Bye." Uh, they go look for Blackman. They don't want to find that. He'll he'll hurt him. Blackman's a yeah. Blackman's a monster. He is a, a bounty hunter too. Oh man. yeah, no, I, I he he was pitching a uh, reality show for a little while. Yeah, w- which is weird. Like uh, Doctor D, Dave Schultz, and Blackman are both bounty hunters. So. I would rather get found by Doctor D. Yeah. <laughs> yes, this he, is no, I'm, I'm just saying, I'm Black Blackman ain't funny. Like that's what worries me. Dr. D's got a sense of humor. I feel like he'd at least crack some jokes. He'd be entertained. Yeah. Blackman, I feel like we just like scissor kick you in the back of the head. Yeah, I, I don't want that. No. Nobody wants that. No, no. But what I do want is some blood sport. And that's going blood down sport. this Saturday. And I can't wait. So, again, Simon. It is I from an undisclosed know. location, by the way. Literally. And there's been some red herrings on Twitter, right? Because uh, there was one piece of promotional material that said UWF USA. There is one, whatever. So people are trying to trying to figure out, but you won't, you won't, and don't ruin it for me. Stay off. Of I'm just, I'm I'm just gonna say, it's not it's not on a Caribbean island. I'm gonna say it's not on a Caribbean island, but it's also oh. not not on a Caribbean island, or not in a Saudi anywhere where you get stuck on a, a tarmac. I mean, I'm just saying. I, you know, little known fact. Um, there are many abandoned oil rigs along the Gulf Coast. I'm not telling you this for any particular reason. I'm just saying there are abandoned oil rigs ac- along the Gulf Coast that you could very easily fit a pro wrestling ring in. 
I'm not saying that's where it was. I'm not saying that's where it will be. I'm not saying that's where it could be. I'm just saying these places exist, and you could absolutely fit a pro wrestling ring inside of one of them. Damn right. But for you to find out, you are going to have to purchase Bloodsport 4 and possibly 5. Uh, and you can do that at bloodsport.watch. Uh, they've got awesome combo packages. I picked up one myself, which I picked up a package. Yes, I just said that on air. But yeah, well, uh, that's it. But well, that's hey, it. <laughs> You did say you worked for FedEx before, so that makes sense. This is true. This is facts. So... Uh, before you, ha- as you march into Bloodsport, uh, do you have any shout outs of people that have encouraged you uh, in this particular endeavor, both professionally and or personally? No, I think most people think this is a bad idea. Yeah. <laughs> they, uh, they, uh, um, obviously there, there's a, uh, there, there's always people you got to shout out there. People that, uh, you got to, you got to give credit to, um, I, I tend not, how can I put this? I don't want anyone's name sullied by being connected to me. I guess that's always the way I look at it. I'd rather that, – that's why I'm kind of anti-shout-out is because I always feel like I don't want someone to be embarrassed because I because they're attached to me. That's, I mean, I know Brian Pillman Jr. I know how that feels when you're embarrassed by somebody you're friends with. It's it's rough. It's you just, You're like, man, could you just not – just stop, please. Stop making me look bad for being your friend. Well, that's not going to happen here. I am absolutely proud to have you on this very podcast. I am proud to be your friend. And, uh, you know, this is, uh, you're what, much like Barnett. It's just like, it's kind of weird, right? Because I'm just a dude that watches you guys do the thing and whatever. And then I'm talking to you guys about doing the thing. And it's just fucking amazing. But I, I, and again, when you were talking about the whole news thing and the whole media and reporter thing, that's why I'm, I'm an interviewer and podcaster because again, I don't want to, I don't want my friends that are professional ass kickers to be mad at me come kicking my ass. Fuck no. That's not going to happen. I just oh, no. ask the questions. That's it. There's only one bit of like uh, breaking news that I did. That was when like, uh, uh, what's his name? Fucking. Jason Miller, May- Mayhem Miller got arrested the last time. And that's the only thing that I've done in my entire career, like five years. The only like breaking news that I did was, was that. So I, I, I'd rather. Now, what was he charged that. with mayhem? Yeah. And, and, and his previous charges were, Oh, well that's, were said nakedly breaking into a church, setting off a fire extinguisher and waiting for the cops to come. Yeah, that that would be mayhem. That seems that that seems like a publicity stunt. I don't know, man. That's <laughs> that's a, that's a worker, bro. That's a worker. I'm, I'm just I'm just saying, if I'm trying to draw attention, if you in the next twenty four hours, if I, if I can do this before my flight, I will say, if you hear about me being naked in a church with a fire extinguisher, it's absolutely to promote blood sport. Available at www.bloodsport.watch. You know. You can be following it, Josh Barnett's Bloodsport on on Instagram and Twitter. You can be following Game Changer Wrestling, which also obviously is is uh, helping to promote the event. Um, you could be following uh, Eric Paul or uh, Eric Paulson on uh, yeah. from uh, Combat Submission Wrestling. Uh, that that doesn't have anything to do with this. I just think he's got a great Instagram page, a lot of cool techniques. Paulson is a uh, student, obviously of a uh, of uh, Dan Inosanto, who is uh, Bruce yes. Lee's training partner. He's a uh, expert in Jeet Kune Do as well as uh, training catch wrestling with Satoru Siyama. He uh, mm-hmm. fought in. Uh, in Shuto when he was a younger man. And so, I mean, it's a lot of good stuff there. You can the call your judo method, call your brothers that steal a lot of stuff from them. They're, they, 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 they train John wick. They're the ones that train Keanu Reeves for John. Wick. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's a, and really uh, any French Canadian, just because hearing French Canadians speak English is just the most adorable thing in the world to me. It's a French Canadian always sounds, <laughs> they can describe the most. They go banana. They, 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 no, oh no, not even that. The one that got me was when I was watching don't fuck with cats and the cops like describing the murder scene. And it sounds adorable, even though he's describing it as a brutal murder. And then I go in, and I see the body, and I see the place where the head was cut off, and then the head is waiting on the toilet, and I'm like, this is so horrible, and I go to it. And I'm just, it just makes me laugh. And I, and it, it's horrible because like, he's describing a very violent, disgusting crime, but I'm just giggling because they're, they're trying so hard to speak in the, 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 this, this officer has mastered two languages. He's speaking French and English, but for whatever reason, he's speaking the English with the cadence of French. And that's getting me. 
It's the cadence that gets me. It's not. It's not the pronunciation. It's the cadence. Oh, because, yeah. I mean, it, you, you know how you meet someone when they give you a phone number? There they go. It's, it's one, two, three, four, five, six, six. seven, eight, nine, ten. That's mm-hmm. that's the cadence. But then everyone's probably with someone who's like four, five, three, one, and all of a sudden you're thrown off yes. because they gave you too many numbers. You're like, no, no, no. That's that's too many numbers. It's how it's three numbers and three numbers and two then two. So yes. it. But for whatever reason, French Canadians have that that interesting cadence. It, oh, it's why. Uh, uh, oh, it's why. What? Go ahead. Who was it? Um, I think it might have been Mike Bailey. Uh, when I first met him, I didn't realize I knew he was from Quebec, Speedball. but I never put together. Yeah, Speedball. I never put together. He had the accent. It's not even like a heavy accent, but I just didn't realize. I went, oh God, you're from Quebec. Okay, yeah, of course. And then he told me what his real name was, and I went, Oh my God, that's that's all the name. He has like the longest yeah. name in human history. It's crazy. He should be in a blood sport. I want him to get back in the U.S. so he can do one. Oh, yeah, that's it. Damn you Canadian borders being closed. Oh, that would be great. Actually, if you want to break some news, I'm just going to say, I don't know if this is news yet, but you know who, who showed a little interest in being in a blood sport? Ooh. Tangaloa, one half of really? GOD from New Japan. He is he has shown some interest. He he hit, he hit publicly asked me. He told me he, he, was, he was looking into it. So I... And it's not out of the realm of possibility because Alice Coughlin, who will actually be on the show tomorrow, is a New Japan contracted talent. I mean, so much so that he actually had to contact the office to get on yes, to this podcast. So I'm he just, is, and I, I will just say, you Tongans, man, they are. That is that is the son of Haku. Mm-hmm. That is, you you tell me, I, I'm part I, that, Indian. I, That's part of I my know. lineage. That's, and you know, yeah, you yeah. you know the order. It goes it goes Samo it goes Tongans, Samoans, Fijians, Hawaiians, and this is this is more in order of how how chill they are. Also, that you'll appreciate my my joke. How many how many Samoans does it take to screw in a light bulb? How many? One, but twenty three will show up. That's facts. I, I can't even. You've been to my. It, it's always a part. What you're saying exactly. Exactly. It's it's you got if one Samoan is there, there's twenty three others. It's I mean it's why if you ever want to have a good laugh, go back and watch the Make a Different Spot Two uh, promos. Because yes. he's because basi- Rikishi's basically telling uh, MC Hammer's life story. Because MC Hammer's whole deal was he would dance to James Brown songs in front of the uh, Oakland uh, the Oakland A's Coliseum, the Oakland Coliseum for uh, tickets, and that was before he was a Bat Boy. And he's telling the same story, talking about break dancing in front of the. Uh, the cow palace for tickets to see wrestling. I'm like, motherfucker, aren't your uncles and cousins all yes. on this show? Like, yes. like Peter Maivia was was God in San Francisco because all the yes. Samoans that live there. Like, you know, you mean to tell me that you're like you, you have to beg for tickets? Like they're that much? They're they're that cardy? They weren't letting you in? I that it it got me. I was looking. I was watching the. I don't know why I, I watched the promo, but I remember I was like, "Wait a second, that's not right." You. Oh fuck! Yes, it's that's that's, and you and I are both NorCal. I mean, we're transplants of where we are now, but yeah. we're NorCal yeah. guys. San Rafael represents Santa Rosa. Stand up. That's what that's oh, yeah. this dude. Oh yeah. This... Oh no, and I it was it was all about the you go to the Cow Palace, the Oakland Coliseum. Those were the buildings. San, you'd go to the San Jose if you really wanted to stretch it, but San Jose was always that was a little bit of a chore. But no, it, it was that weird. It was it was one of those things where sometimes they tried so hard to do like a a, a, a story, they forgot that it was so easily checkable. Mm-hmm. And you go, wait, that doesn't make any sense. Like, isn't he in the the famous Samoan wrestling family? Like, why is he why is he the one they're not letting in? What did he do wrong? <laughs> he made a like, difference. They're, they're letting eight years. Yeah, they're, they're letting the eight-year-old. They're letting the eight-year-old the Rock in. Also, that was, that was my first thought at, when I saw the Young Rock as a show. I was like, "Man, where did you find three half black, half Samoan actors? Like, that's crazy." They didn't pick me, damn it. I, well, here's the problem: it, it, you're aged out. That's the issue. Oh, that's true. That's right. You see, that's the issue. It's it's you're aged out. They, you're, if you were like if you were ten years younger, you maybe could have been College Rock. I got a son named Owen. Maybe that's, we might. We might do that. I'm just saying. I'm going to see if there's casting calls, hey, is what hey. I'm saying. 
That you could exactly. There's got if they're calling for little Samoan boys. That's that's always the little Islanders. Yeah, just saying. Like, but obviously, as you march into <laughs> Bloodsport, I didn't mean to laugh when I said Bloodsport. As you march into Bloodsport Four, uh, where can people find Simon Grimm as he marches in to the? Uh, I'm, I'm at all. I'm at. I'm, I'm at all the same social media stuff. I've been at Devious Journey on Twitter and uh, got styled over to be because they still won't change it on Instagram. I've tried. If you if you think you're the first person to ask me why I haven't changed it, you're not. Um, but uh, yeah, no, just all that stuff over on ProWrestlingTees.com as well. I got my t-shirt designs. Not that one. That is a unique design you actually have to order for me directly yes. or see me at a show. Yeah, which um, I did. But Bumps and bruises. My other designs by many... F- he did. Oh, yes. I was at... Uh, was that uh, Bateman or was that uh, uh, Funny Bone? That was Bateman because I was trying to get you guys both to cut the promo of Carney Strong style. And you guys are... Yes. And I threatened to cut his fingers off. That's what it was. <laughs> yes, it is. Yes. See, that's what we're That's friends. what I do. Exactly. I threatened to cut people's fingers off in front of you. That's, you you didn't report mind. me to the police. That's always very appreciative. Exactly. I mean, I admitted that I was going to commit a felony on camera. That was... <laughs> Well, the footage. No, I mean, I got real, I got away with worse in F- in uh, MLW. Wait, okay, go go for it. Go on. Go for I was it. gonna say the. Uh, I, was, I was gonna say that uh, MLW. There was a, uh, we we did a run in. We dumped gasoline all over a bunch of guys in a battle royal and tried to light them on fire. And I, I think it was oh, man, they only yeah. find us. Well, yeah. Only in pro wrestling could you commit like a violent felony on national television that's recorded and broadcast with 500 people watching in attendance, including members of security and NYPD. And we just got a fine. It wasn't even that much. It was kind of, it was like $1,200. I was like, man, this, was I, it, I was, was pretty, that? I was pretty sure we were going to jail. I gotta be honest. Like we were, that was like, was, that's, that's a felony on camera, man. I don't even know what to say to that. Was that at Cicero's though? Cicero stadium? Was that? No, that was, that was in New York. Okay. Because oh, yes. I was going to say, I mean, that probably in the chain of command, that's probably like the most docile thing that you could do at that particular arena. <laughs> oh, yes. But I, I should probably stop taking up some of your time. I, I, we're at no, two hours and 30 minutes. so that's... You are amazing. And again, thank you, Simon Grimm. I, uh, you, this is one of the reasons why you're my pick for, to beat Filthy Tom Lawler, UFC veteran, this Saturday on Bloodsport. So uh, go ahead and make us all proud and kick the shit out of uh, somebody that used to be one of your uh, stable mates. Hell yeah. I will be sure to. Hell yes. And thank you guys for joining us here at According to Woods. And if you haven't already done so, go ahead and like, share, and subscribe to the According to Woods podcast on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitch. I mean, Simon, you're subscribed, right? I am not, but I also don't listen to podcasts. But I think you should be. You should be better than me. Be better than me. Don't be me. Look at this. I have to shave. I have to cut my hair. I, I Don't be like me. I've got my, my awkwardly placed green screen. Don't be like me. Be, be like a good man. Be According good to man. Woods, follow, yeah. subscribe, smash. This. You're supposed to smash the subscribe button, as I've been told. Smash yes. it, break it, set it on fire, send it to like, war. Damn right, damn right. And again, have it, send it to Afghanistan where it will lose a leg. And hopefully get a drink or at least uh, some hashish <laughs> afterwards. But anyway, <laughs> yes, I, I, mean that. I never said that. I never, I did. There you go. <laughs> so again, thank you, Simon, for joining us. Thank you guys for joining us here at According to Woods. And if you are want to be like me and unlike Simon, um, go ahead and subscribe. But don't just take my word for it. Here's another professor and NXT notable, Zeta Zhang. Hey, this is Zeta Zhang.